getting this show on the road. Just checking to see if I need to restart the stream or the quality options. Nope, we're all good today. All right. Welcome, friends. This is stream number 423. I'm still working on my WebSocket library, ported to Rust. And hey there, Resubaka. You managed to get in here first. Hi. So that was recommended to me multiple times over the last several years to check out the Autobahn test suite for testing WebSocket implementations. Hey there, Sarian. You are second. The Autobahn test suite is linked to right here. And it uh, has built into it a suite of tests that we're going to try to use today. Hey there, Endurn. Yeah, no Adam EJ, but you have the other EJ if you um, have the channel points to unlock it. Hi. <laughs> so, long story short, down here, let me find it. There's a whole list of who uses it and stuff like that. Long story short, there's a Docker image, and they give you the command to run to start the test suite with the tester in uh, server mode. So we would use it to test our client implementa implementation. So that's what I'm going to start with today. Oh, did Twitch give you an ad? I'm sorry, Endurn. <laughs> Hopefully you didn't have to see more than one ad. So I have this Docker image set up on my Linux box, and it's running here. I uh, made a little runit.sh that has the uh, this basically this command in it, and it's running the test suite. I actually tested it yesterday with Autobahn's own Python implementation. The test is pretty quick. I think I guess we could run it again for old time's sake. So they give you the command for running Autobahn's client right here. So um, I already have this script. I just need to run it if I can remember where I put it. I think I just put it under the Autobahn folder. Yeah, there it is. So Python 3 test EE. So it's running them. I remember it not taking this long. Okay, it's done. So some of the tests take a little bit longer than others, but yeah, 249 tests. And at the end, it generates a, a report. If I remember correctly, I can do fire, uh, Firefox reports. Clients index HTML, and we get a nice report. Ah, uh, yeah, squish it down so it doesn't overlap chat. They don't have a nice summary anywhere that I could see. So you kind of have to scroll through it to see if there are any failures. There are a lot of missing test cases because they... Um, Give you an example where some of the um, test cases are excluded. All the ones under 9, 12, and 13 are excluded, right? So it's going to run everything else. But yeah, it looks like it all passes. So if I succeed today, I'll have a column for my implementation. We can see if we have any um, failures or if they all pass just like their own code does. Maybe we'll even turn on 9, 12, and 13. I think those are those are disabled because they're testing limits. Yeah, so it's gonna it probably takes longer. It's more um, work. Okay, so it wasn't perfectly straightforward how to actually set up a client to run the test. So um, it took me a little bit of searching, but I um, I ended up figuring out how to how to do it by looking at tongues tonight. We'll go there again. This is the um, the traditional WebSocket library in Rust. In their GitHub, they have an Autobahn folder with a fuzzing, oh no, that's not it. Source, no, examples, it's here somewhere. Here we go, Autobahn client. And they kind of they kind of show you how to connect to the Autobahn fuzzing server to uh, run the tests. Hey there, Uber Unix, how are you doing? Now you finally got the Twitch notification that I'm alive. <laughs> you know the other thing I noticed like, recently? Um, when um, when I log into Twitch now, let's say let's say I go to the following list, it shows that I'm offline, and I have to actually. Okay, 
Oh, because I'm streaming, it switches to online. If I'm not streaming, it shows me as offline, even if I'm watching Twitch. I don't know why. Anyway, not that it really matters. I think it only shows up for people you marked as friends or something. Okay, anyway, the um, how do you run the test suite? So first there is a, a grab of the case count, and then there's a loop. And then for every case, you um, do this run test. And run test is looks pretty basic to me. You're just connecting to the fuzzing server where the case that you want to run is part of the URI. And then the processing after you're connected consists of just sitting there reading messages. And if you get a text or a binary, you echo it back. And if you get anything else, you do, don't do anything. The uh, get, getting the case count is a is another special WebSocket connection, where we just read one message and we parse it as a uh, integer. So the other thing that I notice in here is that um, we say um, what agent we are. Interestingly, they don't use the user agent header as far as i can tell so whatever we, agent we put in here i believe will show up in um, here for the column so if we put like um uh i don't know foobar or something it'll show up right here and our results will, will be on that list okay so time to i guess write the client and see if we can i think the first thing would be can we get the uh case count Right, so let's do that. I'm going to make an example under our WebSockets to do this, I think. So that's examples. Hey there, JT. How are you doing? Under examples, let's make autobonclient.rs. I totally didn't steal that the idea of that name from Tungstenite. <laughs> I'm going to try to implement it myself and not, not t cheat too much. So, fn main, and we're going to be ending up uh, using, um, I, I forget, do you do super colon, colon star? I, I guess I could look at one of the other examples to see what we're, what we're doing. No, we're, we call out the crate directly. So this would be, uh, what did I call, what's the provisional name for this? just WebSockets. Okay, so the provisional name is WebSockets, and we want a WebSocket client builder, at least, right? And we're also going to need um, a Rimu Web client. Oh, we don't have that um, in the cargo tunnel, so let's add it. Rimu Web client and I haven't published that one yet, so I have to go by relative path. HTTP client. So then that should, after it does a cargo check, now we should be able to autocomplete that, and I want the HTTP client from there. All right. So we need to set up an HTTP client to get a connection. So let's go look and see my example for that in here in Rover. Right, so we make a new client and then fetch. We make a request. We set the target URI and then we um, try to fetch that. And to see the connection used is going to be an upgrade. Oh, I should import that one use that all right so connection use upgrade to i think we need to specify the protocol yeah protocol so upgrade protocol uh string from websocket all right and then uh, we need request so that is Rimu web request and then we need uh Rimurai. 
which I don't have pulled in, so that's another dev dependency. So that is published. Let me check to see what version it's at. It is at 1.1.1, so just 1.1 will be fine. And then um, we want a URI from that. Depend on all the things. That's right. Hey there, Red Sky One. How are you doing today? We're going to be trying out the Autobahn test suite in a little bit. Okay, so um, the URI here, let's just hard code it. Uh, it's going to be H -E uh, WS, actually. Uh, my Linux box is cheetah.local. Port is 9001, I think. Let's look back at here. What did I have it set to? Not that terminal. This one? Um, wow, okay. 9001, all right. Cheetah, yeah. So, like, my Linux box is named Cheetah. Oh, what's this? A resub from Uber Unix for two months? Oh, thank you. Subversary? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the support. Yeah, so computers in my house are named after animals. So Cheetah is my Linux box. Gecko is my Windows box. I think we have a lizard somewhere, a um, dragon somewhere else. No, it's not called Snail. It's called Gecko. <laughs> it should call it Snail. Yeah, I think I named my Linux box Cheetah because, you know, the, the idea that Linux is always faster. The Epic Unknown has 18 months. That's That's two baby rages. for the epic unknown <laughs> thank you for the resub i appreciate it okay so all we need we need to add to, to this uri right because autobahn wants us to go to get case count resource so that's what i'm going to do all right say so we don't have a all right client needs to be mutable in order for us to make, fetch a request uh, await is inside only in async. Okay, so I need to move this to async. <gasps> Uber Unix just gifted a sub to guard one okay? Wow. Thank you, Uber Unix. That was very generous of you. Yeah, so I made fetch asynchronous, so, hmm. I'm inclined to just say use futures executor and then just say executor block on async the rest of this stuff because why not right and then um and indents a little bit but that's okay okay now what's wrong with this fetch i uh, can't convert it into a request what eh The trade bound request convert from request is not satisfied. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Oh, I wonder if it's because I... It might be because I'm um, on one of these libraries I'm not depending on the published version of... And I didn't publish Rhyme Web yet. Okay, why would this... Why would this be an error? Maybe it's one of these other things here. Okay, so I, in order to get the error, I need to import the error from the client. So that's error here. Or, hmm, I can say there's going to be lots of different errors. So what if I do um, error as underscore? No method named source. Traits can... Oh, um, the method is available from... For boxed error? What? Oh, there's a use I can bring in. Wait a minute, it says... Okay, I obviously I need Clippy to help. Clippy's help. Web sockets. Cargo Clippy example. Autobahn client. Wouldn't be an anniversary without gifts? Aw, thank you. 
You always appreciate my streams? Thank you very much, Epic Unknown. I didn't expect to run into these errors yet. This doesn't even make sense to me. Is it because they're from different modules? Should be the same type, though. Huh. Boxed error? Oh, we have to use standard error error. Okay, we can do that. That's a trait, so that's fine. We can do that. Okay, so now there's just this mysterious problem with fetching. Do I need to implement request in terms of into... In, do I need to implement into request for request? That seems silly, but I didn't have to do that for the example. Did I? Yeah, it didn't... It wasn't required here. Why would I need to do it? I don't get it. Do I need to just say into? Can't infer the type. Do I need to do a move? No. I didn't think so. Okay, I didn't need to do that. Okay, very mysterious. I wonder, is, is it because I'm... Is it because it's something... We're, we're doing this outside the crate for the first time. I wonder if that's why. That would indicate that there's something wrong with the export of that. Okay, that's inside of a sub-module. I'm wondering if the way I exported it is wrong. Oh, it is. Look at that. It's, um... Oh, no, that's... It's... It's... These are renamed, but this is not. Could it be something about with that? Could be. Ah, uh, that's it's just it's just really weird. Okay, may, I didn't need didn't think I needed to do this, but uh, hold on. Let's try adding an implementation of this. So, implementation of. Uh, it's from, right? Or into. One should avoid implementing into and implement from instead. Okay. From request for request. This should just be um, return itself. Oh, okay. So the core does it for us. I don't need to do this. So there's some other problem then. Wacky. Set the mod public? I didn't think I needed to do that, but maybe. It seems counterintuitive to me. So you're saying that I need to say that this is a public module? Uh, what am I comparing with here? It didn't seem to make any difference. Actually, this is giving me a warning saying the documentation is missing for it. Yeah. <sighs> really, really, really weird. I wonder if it could it just be a cargo problem. Oh, wait, there's two references there. Okay, somehow I have it. There's, it's, it's compiling two different versions of it, right? That's probably it. Oh, right. I, 
I think I did publish that. Okay, that's the reason. So I'm using one, one. I have it in the dependency chain. One of them is using it by path, and the other one is using it by um, published um, version name. So yeah, okay. Then I know what it is. I just need to find um, this one. This should say um, one dot Actually, we should search for just Rimu Web in all cargo.toml files to make sure. Okay, so web sockets. Right, the server is pull. Yeah, I need to update. I need these all need to match anyway. Otherwise, we're going to have a mixture. So the client was pulling in the published one while we were pulling in by um, path. And um, yeah, okay. So now it's all rectified. So now it should be fixed. Weird bug. Okay, good. It's all, we're all good now. <laughs> I don't have to mutate the client Y. Oh, fetch is not mutable. Okay. Good, sweet. All right. So then um, this will request that we uh, connect to the server and upgrade to WebSocket. Here's where we handle an error and we'll print it out. If it's okay, uh, we don't need to print the response. Actually, there will should be um, two different patterns for this, right? Because the response, oh. No, the we can look at the status code, right? Kind of errors are confusing, yeah. Can I say, um, I'll need to pull in response for that, I think. Can we say a status code 101? Mm, I don't think I have the pattern correct here. <laughs> um, is that how you do it? Maybe I don't know how to do this. Maybe I won't even try right now. I'll just have a nested thing in here. Good evening, Lentil Stew Dragon and Pro Table Flipper. Show of hands. I got two. Get some waves out. Epic Unknown, hello. Pro Table Flipper. Mental Stew Dragon. Should be response colon? Colon, huh? And then response status code colon 101. Other things? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Sarian. Sarian's here to save me again. Another point. Yeah, because I want to have um, 101 is a complete success, and everything else is an unexpected, unexpected um, result. So I will do it this way. Just keep that as a comma, and then print an error here. E print line unexpected response. We'll print the response status code and response reason phrase. All right, so then um, if it's 101, then it's upgraded, right? So then um, I can take it and um, use it to form a WebSocket. So hold on. We don't need to print all this stuff. I don't need to decode. Okay, we'll just say uh, connected to WebSocket server. Does that dot dot syntax just put the default play? It's like it's like fill in the rest. It's kind of like the same thing in JavaScript. It just means you know etc. or don't care. Yeah, exactly. It's a kind of it's a don't care where it's multiple values because response has many fields in it that we could match against. Um, actually, I'm wondering what's the difference in those patterns if a public thing versus a non-public thing. Probably the public ones are the only things we can list here, right? Hey there, LumaCode. I'm doing okay. 
I was really struggling with my code the last few days, and that's part of the reason I wasn't streaming, is um, I, I kind of wrote it up in my Discord. I had a real hard problem using um, asynchronous mutexes inside of um, stream implementations. I mean, it's like really low-level stuff. When my when my wife asked me how did they go, and I said it was rough, I had a problem that it took me five hours to get through, and she said, oh, what was the problem? I'm like, I don't even know the first thing I should say to try to explain it because it's so technically deep <laughs> like in the jargon I have to, she doesn't know anything about programming really so I'd have to explain like everything in a way that a that a non-programmer would be able to understand some of it it's it's really hard it's one of the hardest things I've ever um had to try to do hi there grandson T.S. Jost how are you doing and LumaCode again Probably fixing. I did f fix it. Well, I I worked around it. I, I I put it in the Discord too. So instead of getting a asynchronous mutex at all inside of a stream, a poll, I just used a channel. <laughs> so that if you go to my Discord, you'll see it like a whole bunch of complicated logic to handle a, a mutex and then internal state. I just said, oh, let's just use, just use a channel. The channel has a, a poll, I just forward to that, and it's fine. I'm like, why didn't I just do that from the beginning? But then part of me is like, well, in the future, what if I run into a situation where I have to use a, a, a mutex while polling? I had no idea how to hold on to the future you get for a mutex guard. I could not for the life of me figure out how to store it without creating a self-referential structure with a weird lifetime constraint problem. <laughs> because the... Mutex guard is constrained to the lifetime of the mutex, which is a field of the overall structure. And I don't quite, I don't, haven't quite figured out structural pinning and all that stuff yet. So I'm like, the answer is probably somewhere in my in understanding of structural pinning. And I was watching John Hu's video about pinning, and um, I watched it once through, and I thought I understood pinning, and then it turns out I only maybe got maybe forty percent of pinning. All right, so then. I think this is what I want minimally, just to make sure we can connect to the dang thing. Oh, wait. Um, this request needs more than the target. We need to run it through the WebSocket builder. So let WS Builder equal one of these guys. Start open. And we're supposed to pass it the request, I believe. Yeah. No, we get back of the request. Okay. So rather than making a new request here, we get back the request. So... Uh, what are the arguments here? Builder and then request. So let WebSocket Builder and the mutable request, because we're going to mutate it to add the target, equal that. Then I update the target. Right? And then if we get a 101, then we can upgrade it. So we can say this dot finish open. I need the connection. Oh, right, we're going to need to split the connection into its transmit and receive parts. And next frame size, let's say none for that. And what do we get from finish open? We get a possible error and we get a web socket. So let the, um, so if let OK web socket equal that, else we'll print an error. And the error will be like this. Actually, I have something that does errors. What if I put this into an async block that handles errors cleanly? Async function, um, why don't we just name it what it is? Get case count. So, I uh, don't think we need, an oh, let's, let's pass in the, let's borrow the client. Uh, client is a, borrowed HTTP client. All right, and then we'll move the bulk of this in there. Move that in there. And then um, we'll have it return a result. Um, use size is what we eventually want, but right now I'm not going to actually receive that yet. We'll just see if it, there's an error. So because we're returning an error, we um, and, uh, oh, we should define our own kind of error, shouldn't we? Yeah. Do we have this error? We do. Okay, cool. 
I ha don't yet know how to do this by hand, so I'm going to cheat and look in source error and just copy this whole thing because <laughs> I'm, cause I'm lazy. All right, and then paste it here, and then we'll just um, delete all, all but one error. So just delete fest here. All right. And I need to use um, the other error crate some that people were telling me to use. Um, it starts with an A. Anyhow, that's what it is. Uh, but not yet. So we don't need to be, it's not pub, because it's an, an example. I need to pull in this error. And I need to pull in debug too, don't I? Wait, what is it telling me? Oh, I can't name it error. I already defined multiple times. So what should I call it? Well, I could... Hmm. Can I say as that and then not have to say... Ah, uh, that'll work. Then I get to use the word error. Okay. And um, I should catch up with chat. I missed some chat. PS just good you come pretty good just pull in anyhow be lazy yeah I don't I don't know anyhow yet <laughs> it's an, just an example of being lazy it's okay I do want to come back and um and and clean it up later why does it say that I'm not using it oh it's redundant why is it redundant Oh, right, because you don't need to use if you pull it in directly like that. Okay, so then what error do I... What, it depends on what errors I want here. Uh, this kind of error would be... Uh, FET, um, would be a um, HTTP error. And its source would be a um, RIMU web client error. All right, so the... Um, unable to connect... Uh, to the uh, web server. And I'm not going to bother doc documenting it because it's just an example. Okay. So then um, we don't do that. Instead, we would just do that early return and then strip the OKs off. So this just becomes a fetch results. Uh, two different kinds of fetch results, right? Why am I still getting a... Uh, Oh, because the um, re the return type is not correct. So that means I just need an OK at the bottom, right? Yes. All right. And this is an underscore Y. You can only use an, an async block that returns. That's what we're doing. Oh, right. We're get got to, get to get rid of this exec ex executor block on. Because we're in an async function. Do that and remove that. Couldn't convert the error. Oh, right. I got to map an error, map the error to um, error HTTP error. Okay. And then what's this one? Mismatch types expected result. Oh, I need to put in a question mark there. Okay, getting there. What does it not like about response? Can't find response. Oh, because it's buried in there. How do I get that out? Do I need to do like response at? There was a way to do that. I forget how to do that. Or is that the name and we can use it? Or do I need to do results at that? And then do results.response. Mismatch types. Okay, it expected a reference. We can do that. Okay, cool. So then, um, what if I just say let response equal results response, and then I don't need to say that anymore, and I can put an at in front of, th oops, those two. Okay, we're getting there. I just need to rem I just need to um, split the connection there in a second. I want to clean this up though. We still need the block on, but the block will be on the um, 
get case count. Would response response at work? I can try that in a second. This is going to be block on get case count, borrow the client. And then we're going to let the, um, well, it doesn't actually have a return value. So we just do. Oh, I wanted to catch the error. So match. Yes. Match block on get case count. If it's an error, we're going to print it nice and clean. Otherwise, it's okay, and there's nothing in there right now. Uh, let's just do nothing on, on error. All right? And then delete all this code that we moved. And we should be good, right? Okay, that's good. Now let's try your idea, Sarian. So, move, so remove results and say response, response at. I'm not, that looks like it's going to work, but I'm just not familiar with how to use the at sign there. I th okay, I think I see how it works. So the thing that you want to name, you put the name at in front of it. Okay, I got it. Thank you, Sarah Yen. I'm learning, I'm learning little things about Rust, and I hope you're learning things too, if you didn't know that already. Never tried grabbing a sub-pattern before. So that's grabbing a sub pattern because it's inside of the overall pattern interesting so i just need to break my connection into transmit and receive i believe we can do that because why uh the connection where's the connection oh the connection is part of fetch results right right so then i can um Say so actually we know we know the rest of it. It's uh connection. And then um I believe we can do connection split. If I um I don't remember which way is which. I think it's transmit and then receive, but who knows? It could be the other way. I believe for that to work I need to pull in an extension trait. Oh, it's an option? Oh, yes so i should say um connection if we want to match um well i can actually just do an error here uh, if no let connection equal connection unwrap or else, or is it unwrap or? Or is it okay? It's one of these. Is it okay? Okay or? I think it's okay. Or is it? It's one of these. Or that's for options. Do I want okay? Or transforms the option into a result. That's what I want. Yes. Okay. Or um, error. Uh, I need to come up with a new one. No. No. Um, this actually shouldn't happen. You shouldn't get a one on one without a connection being given back. No connection. We'll make we'll make one anyway. Um, connection was upgraded, but we didn't get it for some reason. We didn't get it from the client for some reason. And then question mark. Okay. So I need to do a use, right? Use futures async read extension. Cool. Now did I get it backwards? Read half and then write half. Yeah, I got it backwards. TX and then RX. And I think I need to box them then, right? Yes. So, box new. And box. I hope this works because this is what my original API was intended to allow you to do. Oh, I think it's going to work. I just need to borrow that mutably, the builder. Ooh, there we go. We got a WebSocket. Okay, so... um. 
I don't need to do that, to do that right? I can um, say, just let that equal, oh, let WebSocket equal that, okay, or, uh, hold on, does this return, it does return a result, so I should do a map error. Uh, error, uh, web socket. We'll invent another one here. Web socket source is uh, web sockets error. Uh, what should I put here for for the text? Got it. Got some kind of error with the web socket. Uh, web socket. Error in WebSocket, how about that? Horrible d text description, but really the gist of it is in here in the source anyway. So then, um, question mark. And then we get the uh, WebSocket, right? We're not doing anything with it yet, but that's fine. We'll say um, to do, do something with the WebSocket. Basically, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, so right now we're just going to... Um, drop it and this is where I'll, I'll test the the beginning part first so we should be able this is enough to get a websocket connection how come this is saying that there's oh we can just say http not http error clippy teaches me stuff all the time and a panapudi and did i never say hi to silmuth hi silmuth as for errors in the example, I'll just use box dyn error error as the error type. All errors should nicely convert automatically. No need for anyhow or defining custom error. I, I'm doing the custom error mostly as practice because I want to do that in libraries using this error. Um, I don't know yet about boxing a dyn error. You mean instead of needing to know the exact type here? Yeah, I could just make it a dyn error and then let um, this error take care of it for me? I suppose. Let me uh, give you a point for that and put that as homework to try. Makes sense for libraries. Yeah, but but the, would would a library list the exact error type here, or would it just box a dyn error? See, it's hard for me to actually get information about what's the best practice in Rust because there's not a whole lot of that out there on searches so if i search like best way to package the source of an error and like there's too many search terms so i really value your input if you say that um if this was in a library would i use the concrete type here or would i turn this to box dine standard error error like i don't know which one's better that way or that way right Anyhow, so if I used anyhow, it probably, I don't even need to say that, right? So I just need to learn anyhow. <laughs> if it makes sense for a library to return nicely typed errors, well, okay, so it's it would be nicer for me to keep it like it is if this was in a library, because it's nicely typed. Yeah, all the info it can provide, got it. Okay, I want to test this. Unused, I didn't use the WebSocket build. Oh, I, I didn't. Hold on, how do we... How did it use it in here, then? Oh, we we made it out. I, that was an extra line. Didn't need that. That's an extra line, too. Okay, so this is the example. I should be able to connect to the Autobahn fuzzing server and get a case count that we're going to drop. So we just want to make sure that we get the connection. Actually... Let's put another print here. Got a WebSocket. Uh, successfully opened a WebSocket connection. This is HTTP server and it's... Um, well, actually the successful connection happens before we get a 101. Maybe I don't need to do that. Actually, we're in the middle of a handshake, right? So let's say handshaking with 
H WebSock HTTP server. There we go. And then successfully open. That's that's a better way to describe it. I think there was a Rust conf talking about error handling in Rust. Yeah, it's cool. It's stuff like that that I um, it's hard to find that stuff. Like no one has curated a list of like here are the first hundred things and conferences and videos you should watch and look at to learn things. Thank you for the follow, by the way. Oh, thank you, Pro Table Flipper. You deserve at least one point. Let me give you a second one, because you're giving me stuff to watch. I enjoy watching stuff that teaches me. Hey there, Frode. Oh, and Papata stole Papa. Hello, by the way, by the creator of Irie. Huh. Okay. Well. Let's try my um, concoction here. So it would be cargo run example, right? Here goes nothing. 400 missing port and HTTP host header and server runs in non-standard port 901. Ooh. That's a bug in my HTTP client, isn't it? Okay, you guys can't even see the full thing unless I hit enter a few times. There we go. I forgot, I didn't know that you have to put the port number in the host header. I should review that. So that would be under um, HTTP RFC, right? Uh, not that one. It's not that one either. It always brings me to 72... I just need to memorize the number, 7230. So there, it, it's probably in the table of contents here, the host header, right? I don't see it. It's got to be here somewhere, though. Maybe it is 7230. There it is, 54.4. Oh, there is a port number. Look at that. Blah, 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 blah. Where did they say port here? I'm too impatient to read the whole thing. If the connection's incoming TCP port number differs from the default port number, then a colon incoming are appended. I'm surprised they didn't say must be. This clause. So I need to implement that clause. So we need to get the port number two. Apparently so, if it's not the standard one. Only if it differs, yeah. So I suppose since that's a failure in the client, I should add a... Um, oh, but the client doesn't have a, a test suite, does it? Because I don't have that testable. It doesn't use a mock connection yet. So maybe I just fix it and worry about that later. So here's the client. It sets up the host header at some point. I published this yesterday, by the way. Here's where we pick um, the default port. Uh, where do I... Okay, here we go. Um, where do I set the host header? Here it is. Okay, so... Um, I need to compute the port number earlier then. Can I move this code up? and put it before the setting the host header all right that worked okay so then um i kind of need the same table don't i well sort of i need to i need to have an indication if the port is non-standard because you might have manually set port 80 and then we don't want to include that in the host right so um Determine whether or not we need to include the port number in the uh, host header. So it would be a let include port in host header is match. What are we matching on today? I think we're matching on the scheme and the port number, right? Port. GitHub bot, uh, add issue, add domain port, 
that would be cool if we had a is there a GitHub bot in Twitch? <laughs> See if I can fix the bug before you actually post it. <laughs> uh, why? Oh, missing an arm. That's all. We're missing an arm. Ah. Okay. So it would be um some. Actually, I just need the same thing here, don't I? <gasps> what is this? Slick for resubscribe for seventeen months. Slick for one. One of the uh, firsts, right? One of the very first subs. I only have like three founders left, actually. It's kind of sad. I think Slickfer is one of them. Thank you for your support, Slickfer. I really value your continued support. Okay, so um, actually I need to break this down like... This is going to be a little clumsy because I have to say 80 twice, don't I? Hmm. Rip the other seven founders. Yeah, who, I don't know where they went. <laughs> they might have been gifted subs and they're like never watched. They might be bots. I don't know. They're, they're no longer in my list anymore. My bot will be raiding me in like one minute. Why would you raid me with a bot? Please don't do that. Well, thank you for the follow. Your bot rates people after you're done streaming. Okay, well, Monka S. How about we don't? It takes a second to receive. I don't know what you're talking about, Team View Select. Love that I actually say it out, Manka S. <laughs> oh, hey there, Metro Dev. Five point four forty four hosts. Oh, right, you're telling me what section to look at. Got, gotcha. Takes a second for Streamlabs to send the ping to the bot that enters rate. I still don't really know what you're talking about. Are you saying that you're streaming that you're going to raid me? Because usually people just raid. They don't say that they're going to raid. So I guess that's why I'm confused. But, you know, it's okay to be confused sometimes. Um, there's got to be an easier way to do this, right? I need to do something like this, right? True. This seems awkward to me. <laughs> no dad jokes. No dad jokes are okay. Four, four, three. Like the ha fact that I have to repeat that. So all match arms are covered. Oh, it's going to tell me this is too complicated. Yeah. Is nightmare assistant your bot? One of my channel rules is no unauthorized bots, by the way. Because uh, I find them really distracting. Everyone in your chat told you to raid me, so you said, why not? Okay. I'm just not used to people telling me that they're about to raid. They usually just do it. I think, yeah, I need to refactor this anyway. I'm going to, just going to quiet it for now. So how do I say? Mark to do. Uh, refactor this and we'll just turn off the uh clippy warning it joins wherever you go okay all right okay cool so why am i getting identical oh it wants me to oh it's smart it's like you can do that dude uh that all right, so I just need to use that then. There's got to be an easier way to do this. Is this just a really complicated if statement? 
I, I need to re let, let me put something here to do I revisit this there should be a better way all right so I'm just gonna use that down here right I'm being rated by one viewer actually um, I got a thing saying I got I'm being rated with a party of not a number look at that Welcome, not a number viewers, to my stream. <laughs> I don't know if it's one or not a number. Stream element says one, and um, my chat client says not a number. Okay, well, maybe they already jumped to my channel then. Well, welcome raiders, I presume. I'm doing some rust today. Today command says more. So I'm going to be trying to use the Autobahn test suite which um, I can get you a link for, it's here. Autobahn Test Suite is a, um, a nice contribution to open source, if I must say so, F made by the people who make the Autobahn uh, WebSocket um, and other, other um, uh, IO libraries. And um, it's very, very reusable as testi testified by all these different people who are using it. <laughs> So it was suggested to me that since I made my own uh, WebSocket crate for Rust, that I use the Audubon test suite on my own thing, on my own uh, crate to make sure we have uh, no problems. And we've already found a problem. I am not sending the port number in the host header when we're connecting to a non-standard port. I think you did my trues and falses reversed. Oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> of course I got them reversed. Silmeth, you know, I always get things backwards. You know, it's almost like I plan it. Just to show how um, that is a common bug, that you get your logic reversed. So if I didn't fix that right away, we would have gotten the same result saying, you didn't include the port number. I would have been like, what? I thought I did. Oh, it's backwards. Yeah. <laughs> Being wrong with Booleans is, me, uh, is fine because it means you only need to try twice. Being wrong with an integer means you need to try billions of times to get it right. These web sockets for auto raids, or you can either buy or raid. Um, okay. Anyway, <laughs> I don't quite understand that, but we're moving on. I uh, yeah, I am implementing the web socket protocol. By the way, if that wasn't apparent, and web socket RFC, the RFC for that is here. We're implementing that. Didn't do that mistake with U one twenty. Yeah then that would be take the rest of the uh, lifetime of the universe to fix, wouldn't it? All right, um, how do I want to do this? Do I want to just want to alternate what string we put in here? Or do I want to... At this point, it's a string, right? Okay, it's not a string, but this one takes in a string. So what if we just convert it to a string right away, and then if we include the port... Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. String from this... And then I can say, actually, then I can move um, this whole thing down there. Would it be nicer? Because there's an if match. Is that okay? Yeah, that's probably fine. Let's say, determine the host name to include in there. If we are connecting on a non-standard port, include the port number as well. Then I basically combine those two blocks together, so I can do that. And then we can say host.append, I believe, or is it extend? Extend. Or is it just plus equal? Format. Uh, we want a colon and then a port number, right? Port. Which means I need to make that immutable. There we go. Oh, nope. You can't do a plus equals? So it's not plus equals. Is it just right? I think it's right. Host. And then we, we can do that if I pull in the trait for it, right? Uh, hold on. Plus equal reference. But the right is cooler, isn't it? <laughs> and you want the right macro. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. What do I have to use to bring that in? 
Uh, I hate it when it says that. Perhaps add a use for it, and then uh, what is the use? I have to go here to look. Clippy, tell me, what do I need to use? I should have this memorized. There we go. Use standard format right. We shall do that. Standard format right. That's not quite right why, because this connect is moved. How did that get moved? Wait, what? Oh, because of this? Oh, shoot. Before we were leveraging the fact that this would make a clone, so I need to clone it manually here, because we need to reuse the host down here. Okay, so that fixed that. Uh, what's this problem? Oh, it gets cloned every time. We try to connect. All right. Clone, when in doubt, clone. Okay, now what's this warning here? Is this going to tell me it could be an error? Yeah, unused result. Um, that's okay. We're going to say expect. Uh, uh, what, what, what should I say here? Expect. What's the panic message? What should the panic message be say? Uh, we uh, unable to append port number to host name. Should never happen. All right. You'll need to own the left hand only it is extended. So the right hand a plus takes a reference. Right. I think r the right macro looks cleaner to me. And I need to get practice remembering to use that. That you can, you can treat a string as a buffer and write into it. Which I think is very cool. Okay, so then um, am I rerunning my code again? Not Clippy. Where is it? Run Autobahn client. Here we go. Unable to connect. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Oops, we didn't mean to do that. All right. So I... Yeah. This should have a different name then. All right. I had two different variables essentially with the same name. We don't want to do that. So I'm going to remove the string from there. And then I'm going to um, build another one. Let... Um, host header value equal host uh, string from host that means i don't need to clone later on right so then um then we write into that and set it here and i actually don't need to clone it there because it's going to own it and this needs to be mutable all right so then yeah we don't need to clone down here and there was another place i cloned didn't it? where was it Oh, it was there. What? Host.clone. Uh, I guess we're not... We, we're, we, I, I fixed it already. Uh, yes. How did I end up here? I don't know, but there, there it is. Try again. Is it possible for SOAP request to be processed with the TCP UDP connection? Well, SOAP requests are just um, XML payloads on top of HTTP, right? And HTTP is on top of TCP. So, yeah, why not? Hey, look, we successfully opened a WebSocket connection. So on the Audubon side, it should have said we got a connection. Oh, look at that. We got a connection. Why is the peer 172, 117? Oh, no, this was not me. This was the Python client. Oh, it doesn't print a connection. It only prints if it runs a test case. I see. Uh, okay, I'm getting texts from the bank, and I don't know why. That's just saying that, that they're closed. I don't know why I'm getting text messages that says the bank is, being, is closed. Okay. I forgot I'm still printing out junk inside of the HTTP crate. Uh, that's bad, actually. Because I published that. I, no, wait, no, take it back. This is the unpublished client crate. Um, so I can remove that. That's, gonna, that's just going to be annoying until I remove it. So let's remove it. That was in here, right? I had a bunch of print. Yeah, this stuff. I need to remove. This is only for, while we were debugging. So remove all this. 
Um, yeah, all we need to do is generate the raw request, right? These are all prints. Do I have any other print lines? This one. Don't need that. Don't need that. These are all debugging, which I don't need. If I'm not printing the connection address, that actually has a ripple effect, right? That error is I don't need anymore. Print. We're getting rid of the print lines. It's yeah, it's gonna tell me that there's an error I don't need anymore. Oh, unless we used it more than once. Wait, where do we use that? Wait. It doesn't warn me only because we mentioned it in comments? So if I stop mentioning in the comments, is it going to warn me it's unnecessary? Well, that's wacky. Is it because it's public? Yeah, we don't need... I was, I, I'm shocked that it doesn't say we don't need that error anymore. Everything's cool with it. All right, we'll just, ro we'll just roll with that. Run our example again. Make sure the chatter is gone. Cool, chatter is gone. Successfully opened. Okay, now let's have it um, receive back the number of test cases, which means we're going to sit here and process the WebSocket until we get a message, right? Maybe because it's exported as a public type value? Yeah, I guess so. I suppose you're right, Silmuth. And hello, Sai. All right. Hold on a second. Doing some stream upkeep. All right. Do something with the WebSocket. Let's do something with the WebSocket. <laughs> I might as well document my example here. So this is finish the WebSocket client handshake. Client side. All right. And then this would be... Um, right, so the do something would be wait to receive a text message. It should consist of a number, which is the test, ca test case count. So that means we intend to now be returning a use size, right? So then I don't need to do this okay, right? Because we will have yielded it from the match. So... Actually, hold on a second. Why did I do that? This shouldn't be... A, this should be an error. I forgot about that. So what error to put there? Mm, unexpected response. And we can include the response because we're nice people, right? Why not? Unexpected response. This would be um, response. Error. Uh, received an unexpected response from the web server. Perfect. But you thought it was WebAssembly. Uh, at some point, I do want to do WebAssembly with Rust. And I have a friend who does that all the time. So shout out to CM Griffin. If you want to see WebAssembly using Rust, check out his channel. He uses something called U. So that's Rust Y-E-W. If you're, you might, may or may not be familiar, but that's the stack he uses. Yeah. Griffin made the uh, stream parrot, which is the chat overlay above my head. So I haven't yet dived into this, but it's supposedly a really nice framework for doing uh, WebAssembly with Rust. 
Yeah, today you're doing web sockets. Something entirely different. So I need to get rid of this OK, right? And get rid of that. So now we're expected to return something. Let's say zero for now because we don't know. Actually, we better just say to do until we're done, right? Just to make sure that all the compilers are gone. All right, so instead of here, it's going to be a um, size. So what do I say? Um, cases? Cases. So um, let cases equal that. And then, um, hold on, what? Why is it, ex oh, because of this. So um, this should just be return or something. And then we'll um, print line. There are something, test cases in the, uh, test cases enabled in the fuzz server. Cases. We just want to get that number for now. All right. So the um, the weight here, I the way I've set up the WebSocket is it acts as a stream, so we can just do WebSocket dot um, take one, and then um, next. Actually, if we're just going to do take one, we can just do next. Let um, well, if let sum message equal, uh, this actually has to have source message. Uh, message equal, um, we have source message text, right? I can't remember what I did here. <laughs> Um, let's go look. Actually, it would be, um... Oh, for next, I need to enable something, right? Uh, let's do this in a little bit of... Incrementally here. Let x equal w next. It's going to say I can't do that because I need to import some trait, right? Yeah, so quick fix is import stream, a uh, future stream extensions. Now that we have that, what is X? X is a next, and I need to mark the WebSocket as mutable in order to call it. All right, so now we have an X, a next. So that I should be able to put into um, if, right, this thing, if let that equal next do something with it. Otherwise, we have an error, right? So error... Um, WebSocket. Oh no, this can. F is this fallible? No, it's not. It might be fallible. I can't remember. <laughs> um, actually, I can just look at my um test for that to see. WebSocket. Take. I was using take instead of next. Oh no, it's not fallible. You, well, right, a stream isn't fallible, right? You either get something from it or you get none. Unless I make it a stream of results, which I chose not to do. Yeah, I, instead I chose to have errors come back through the sync interface, not the source. So, does that mean I need to monitor the sync interface? I'm not going to bother. It's just going to be... um. What error do we get if we don't get it, if the WebSocket closes? Unexpected or disconnected? Disconnected. Sure, let's make a disconnected error. So then that goes, that to do moves into here. This, where am I? Here we are. Uh, the web socket disconnected before before what disconnected prematurely 
There, that's what we'll say. All right, catch up with chat a little bit. You can have main return result, by the way. Pretty sure that's this error's display imp will print the source of the error. Rather than um, doing this business. So I can just, I don't have to match the error source. I can just print the error and it will do the, it'll include the source for me. Is that what you're saying? There again, we can, I can test that out in a little bit. Just to make sure I don't forget, let me add that to my notebook. Give you a point, because you're probably right. All right, what did I do wrong here? Expected future, oh, I need to do a wait. Right, it's asynchronous. Okay, now source message is wrong. What was it really? Stream message. And stream message isn't quite right. Okay, there we need a variant. We expect, what, a text? Okay, why is it not helping me? It should be text, right? Is it because this is not exported? It is exported. You don't have to export variants, do you? Well, thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Failed to resolve. Can I find stream message in WebSockets? Oh, wait, 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 wait. I don't think I actually export that. So, yeah, that would be a problem. Yes, so this should be WebSocket and... Oops. Stream message. Do I want to rename that to be like WebSocket stream message? I feel the, the answer is no. All right. So getting a message back, we um, just parse it, right? So it's uh, you size parse message. Map an error. Okay, the autocomplete not helping me is usually a sign of me doing something wrong. Okay, so that should have worked. Is message not a string? It is a string. Okay, so then what am I doing wrong? Can I just do that? Let, when in doubt, do that and see what the type is. Okay, so that is a problem. The only problem is I'm not returning something. Oh, is it, um, is it the other way around? Parse. I, I can never really get this right on the first go. Is it that instead? Uh, dot, right? Yeah, that's it. It always takes me a little bit. Okay, so the result, it's a re result which could be a parse int error, so... We can turn this into a um, map the error to error a bad message or something. Well, integer expected. Integer message expected, I guess. Question mark, right? And give a name for that up here. The source is a parse, what is it? Standard, I can't remember. <laughs> Refer back to parse, what does it return? It returns this, which we can't see, can't, dang it. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't have been so hasty. What is X again? Parse int error. Go to it. Parse that thing, I want that thing. So take that back. I'll come at that, go to there. What namespace is it in? It is in source or um, course core num, standard num. We did it. We did it, chat. Okay. Hold on. What's wrong with this one? Missing an error, of course. We need to fill that in. Um. Unable to 
parse text message which should have been a number. All right, now what's wrong with this? Found use size expected enum. Wait, what? Expected a result, found a size. Oh, um, I don't want to do the question mark, right? Yeah, there we go. That's one, one of the cases where we don't do an early return because this is a leaf node. Cool. So then this should just work. What's the warning I'm getting up here? We're not using request. Why are we not? I thought I was using that. Oh, we're not, we're not making one directly, so we don't need, to, don't need to import the type anymore. Got it. All right. Let's run it again. Uh-oh. We didn't get a message. Bummer. Is there something on the Autobahn side that'll give me a hint about what happened? No. It looked like it timed out, right? It connected and then it sat there for a little bit and then did an, a disconnect. I'm wondering, did I miss a step? Am I supposed to send something? So I'm going to look at what Autobahn does. They just read a message. Hmm. Is it time to look at Wireshark? Might be time to look at Wireshark. See what's going on. Why? Uh, let me. This I don't want to reveal secrets like IP addresses. So let me um, blank the screen for a little, little while. That would be which button? I have many buttons at my disposal. Display capture that one. All right. So I'm gonna run Wireshark and set it up so that it's just showing my local network without doxing me. And my Wireshark's old. So I just need to set up a filter here, right? So um, I want a filter where the IP address is... Uh, what's the IP address of my Linux box? I don't even remember. Yeah, we're doing secrets right now. I can't show. IP address... Oh, I know why I was getting that weird address, because it's not inside of a Docker instance. All right. That's 221 on the network. We can show that one. All right, now let me test it to make sure it doesn't dox me. Just run it again. I should see the connection go across. Interesting, I didn't see anything. <laughs> Um, oh, I don't think I had the subnet correct. Okay, that's what it was. Oh, I need to um, further restrict it to just a port number, don't I? And TCP, right. And TCP.port is 9001. Okay, there we go. And this doesn't reveal anything, right? I don't think so. <laughs> this does show IPv6 prefix, so let me clear that screen out. All right. I'm just making sure nothing got leaked here. It looks good to me. I mean, my e Ethernet address shows up, but is that really a problem? I don't think showing my Ethernet address is that big a deal. I don't know. Someone tell me if showing my Ethernet ad Ethernet adapter's address is a problem. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't show that at all. Maybe I shouldn't. I don't know. Mac is fine. Metro Dev, I trust you. If the if it's fine, it's fine. Okay, so we're showing it again. 
There we go. So it does connect. Let's um restart the capture and run it again to make sure. I don't need that window. So no, not Clippy. Run it. So there we go. We get the sin, ack, ack, and then there's the there's the get for the um the case count, and there's our little handshake there. And we upgrade to WebSocket, and the response there's the ack back, and then there's the response. Switching protocols, Autobahn test suite, upgrade to WebSocket accepted. And then there's the accent back, and then about a second later, it disconnects us, right? Which direction is which? Yeah, they're disconnect. They're resetting the connection. So th I guess they're waiting for us to send something. <laughs> the account is yeah now yours. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like it should have worked. It's um, either we're supposed to send something, or I did this. Or I, I have this wrong. You just send anything. I was looking at the autobahn, um, the, the um, what Tungstenite does, and they just say read message. Maybe their read message sends something first. That would be kind of strange, though, wouldn't it? Did I get the? Maybe I got the um, URL wrong. Get case count. That's the correct, right? Oh, these IP addresses are just, you know, inside my network, so they're, they're what, what are they called? Anything that's 192.168 is going to be a private IP, like, that's not public. Hey there, Kashanks. And also, hello to... Did I miss the chat? I see a uh, Hugo Hoffman chat. Oh, there it is. There was the Kappa. I see it now. And also there's one, f there's a message I missed from Cybergenic. Oh, you're right. I actually did see that. I just didn't know that I needed to say hi. Hello. Good evening again. We don't need to say hi to you. Lentils 2 Dragon, you can't fool me. Okay, so um, they connect... Then they read a message, and then they close, and they're supposed to get something back, so... What's the difference between that and what I'm doing? Oh, thank you for the resub, Lentil Stew Dragon, but you've been here for a while now. Did it just pop up the button? <laughs> 21 months, that's a lot of months. I don't know what to um, look at next. Maybe look at their, um, their API, what does read message do? Let's look at um, Tungstenite. API reference, read message. This will queue responses to ping and close messages to be sent. It will call read, write pending before trying to read in order to make sure that no re responses make progress even if you never call write pending. Well, we know that it's not sending anything, because if it, they had sent something, we would have seen it on the wire. But they are, that length is zero. They're not sending anything with the ack. Or that's, that's us acking. They didn't include anything at the tail, did they? Oh, they did include a trailer. Ooh, there's a WebSocket message in there. There it is. There's a WebSocket message in there. Okay, and we're not sending, we're not... There's the number, 249. You see it in there? It's there. So it's a bug on my end. Um, there's a trailer that we're not processing correctly. Okay. Yeah, I forgot about the trailer thing. Okay, so then I know where to look. I know where to look roughly. It would be um, when... We get the response back. There should be a trailer included, and I'm not using that right now. Where's the response? Okay, here's where we get the response back, right? 
fetch results. Oh, we the trailer needs to be added to fetch results because that trailer data needs to be fed into the WebSocket after we um, get it. In fact, it should be part of the finish open. We should include a trailer there. Scrap the project. Project goes failure. GG, nice stream. <laughs> I guess Endured will just have to stop right now and um, do um, some um, games, right? Any games you want to play instead of all this coding? I know, this is a Botland shirt. You can tell? Look at that Botland. I have three Botland shirts. One of them isn't doing so well. It's got holes in it somehow. I'm going through the wash, so, uh, I guess. Minecraft with creepers. <laughs> Alright, um, so there's actually multiple levels that I screwed up on. The, um, where is it? This fetch results needs to include trailing data, like leftover data. So let's include it now. Pub trailer, the vector of bytes. We're going to say if the, yeah, it's, it's if the connection was upgraded to a higher protocol. Which makes me think I should bundle these two together. That would make sense, right? So we'll do that. So um, struct upgrade. Upgrade info? Connection upgrade? Or upgrade? Mm, upgrade results? I don't know. I don't know what to name things. All right, so we're going to remove the thing about if it was. Let's say this. I can't spell this right now. Okay, this holds the underlying connection, underlying transport layer connection, which becomes the caller's responsibility. Okay, and then this holds any extra bytes received by the client. I can't spell right now. This is not this is not how you spell received. This holds any extra bytes received by the client after the end of the upgrade response. All right, and then this whole thing becomes inside of this option here, right? And there's no option here. And then we'll call this some um, upgrade. All right, if the connection was upgraded to a higher level protocol, this um, contains more information. Well, this contains all the information to provide to that protocol. This contains all the information derived from, well, let's just say all the information. I don't know what else to say here. You name for that? Untitled 1.bmp. We can say it's, um, what is it? When you create a new folder? New folder? 0001. <laughs> Alright. Hey there, Rub -a Dub TV. I'm fixing a little bit of a, of a bug I found. Um, I'm, I'm finding bi bugs in my code even before I get to the test suite. But yeah, today is all about running my WebSocket implementation against the Autobahn test suite. Which is... There, if you want to read more about it. It's actually in a Docker image. And it runs a WebSocket server, and then we connect to it and uh, tell it to run various uh, tests on, a, on, a, on the connection. And the first step, which I'm still working on, is um, roughly this, where we... This is showing from another WebSocket implementation how they use Autobahn. You connect to the get case count endpoint to the test server, read, the me read a message, which should be an, a number, and that tells you how many tests we're going to run. Because then later we're going to um, loop for all the test cases 
and uh, do the similar thing where we're going to connect and just um, read messages and basically loop back texts and binary messages. And um, the server tells us if we passed or we failed. So that's what we're working on today. But the bug that I ran into is I, I, can, I, I uh, ran this uh, Wireshark trace to find it. Um, at the surface, it looks like we're getting a WebSocket correctly. And then the server just abandons us after a second of uh, inactivity. But it turns out after the uh, response here, there's trailing data. So if I just show, how do I show just the response part? I don't know how to highlight just the response, but there's the very last header. And you can see after that very last header, there's some extra bytes there. Whenever I ma put the mouse over it, you can't see it anymore. Okay, I don't obviously I don't know how to use um don't know how to use this tool, but at the end here, this two four nine, that's the number two hundred and forty nine, and it's in a WebSocket frame. So basically, the fir the message the server gave us was tacked onto the end of the response, rather than being a, a separate message after the ACK. And I forgot to handle that. That's that's what I've been calling a trailer, and I forgot to attach the trailer to the response. So that's what I'm working on right now. I need to attach that trailer along with the connection to the upper layer protocol so that we can take the trailer and say, hey, this is our very first message. Hey there, Nui. How are you doing today? Okay, so this is in place now. I'm going to have a whole bunch of compiler errors to deal with. So this is going to be um, upgrade, right? And then here's where I need... Um, the trailer. Where is the trailer? Oh, it has to come out of transact. Okay, so let's assume we're going to have it. This is going to be some um, upgrade results, right? I can make can't auto a oh, connection upgrade. That's right. And that's connection and trailer in it. And it didn't like that why. It should have it should have liked that part. I have a lot of really weird red squigglies. I don't know what's okay. It just took it a while. Okay, so we just don't have trailer yet. All right, so then um, here it's upgrade is none. All right, so I need that trailer. I think we're gonna get it out of transact. So let's assume that we get it out. Right? If we get a trailer out of transact, we should be fine. So let's go to transact. And let's say out of this, we're going to get a vector, which is our trailer. Okay. And we should only get that if we get, if, um, if the connection's upgraded. So we need to be a, do a special check for that. Yes. So we will attach a trailer if, so the trailer is the receive buffer if the, um, response says a 101, that's what it's going to be. So, um, do I just want to include that here? I think that's what I want to do. I want to say um, if response dot status code is 101, then it's going to be receive buffer. Actually, why don't I just make that optional? That should you, that, well, hmm. Nah, I'm undecided. Because if we don't make it optional, I have to at least say else vector new or something. Right? Okay, this is a problem because we've already moved it, so I need to grab a copy of it. Let um, status code equal response dot status code. And then I'll move that in here. All right. Okay, so now we, if the status code of the response is 101, the leftovers are whatever we have left in the receive buffer. Otherwise, there aren't any left. There's no trailer. All right. So I still have a warning up here. Why? Oh, because I don't have a documentation on it. All right. This holds information to provide to a higher level protocol in the uh, case where an HTTP connection is upgraded after a response.
There we go. That's what we want to say. So that gets us up to the WebSocket. I'm going to have other compiler errors, aren't I, in the other crate? Yep. Because we're not including the um, the other pieces here. Right, response. So this is upgrade. Right. Okay, so how do we deal with this? Right, we say that it has to be something. Otherwise, there's no... Um, can I rename this? No upgrade. I can. The connection is upgrade. We didn't. We didn't get upgrade information from the client for some reason. That's a long string. Okay. So given an upgrade, the, it's the, uh, the connection has the connection is in the upgrade, right? And then um, here's the other complicated part. The upgrade also has the trailer in it, and that we should give to finish open. Finish open doesn't yet receive it, so I need to stuff it in here somewhere. Let's put it here. Upgrade.trailer. Which means I need to change the API for finish open to have a trailer. Vec U8. Okay, now what are we going to do with this trailer? Yeah, I suppose we need to give it to the WebSocket new, right? So it's need to, it needs to basically percolate all the way down. trailer here, which means new needs to have the trailer added to it right here. Trailer, a vector of bytes. And um, actually, it's got to it's got to go deeper. It's got to go into um, the, um, where is it? The worker thread, right? Yep. So give it to the worker thread. Worker thread. You have it now. I put it after a connection R. Okay. So trailer. Vector of bytes. Now um, it's got to go even deeper because receive frames needs to get it, right? Trailer. Receive frames. Trailer. And again into try receive frames, right? It's got to go all the way down into the depths of my code. Trailer, vector of bytes. Okay, finally we're in here. So before the loop and we get more bytes, we should just feed in the trailer, right? How does receive bytes do this? Oh, look at that. So I need to do the same thing, but with a pre-read vector. Actually, don't I just dump it into frame reassembly buffer? Yeah. Oh, there we go. So we just say that that's the trailer. Easy peasy. It's just that now I have a whole bunch of tests which are broken. Yeah, all these are called new. Okay, so all of these didn't have a trailer, right? So on all of these cases, let's see if I can hit them all at once. Those little hit s several of them. I'll put a um, vec new there. All right. That hits some of them. Now to continue to the next error. Error-driven development. Okay, so these are different, sort of. But again, we can say vec new. I should probably have a unit test where we include a trailer, right? Let me make the note to myself to do that. Uh, reminder, make a unit test in a web socket that tests receiving a trailer after finishing a client handshake. Excuse me. That burp just kind of came out of, of nowhere. All right, now what? More places. Okay, they didn't match very much. I forget which. It's after mass direction. Got it. All right, so vector new. Dirt burp. A vector is a stream of somethings. A vector is an array which is stored where the storage for the elements of the array is on the heap. So it's it's actually more like a um isn't there a vector in JavaScript? It's it's like a um a resizable array. 
at uh, um where the, yeah the size is not known until runtime but it otherwise operates just like an array in c++ it would be standard vector i just don't remember what it is in javascript i thought there was a vec vector or something like that anyway you get the idea <laughs> Remember, I'm granted one over explanation per hour. Array list. That sounds right. Yeah. Sounds right. All right, we're just tra tra tracing down these errors. More of these. I would like mu um, m multiple cursors to hit it. That's going to hit a whole bunch of them, which is good. I like that. Vec new. Some people prefer, by the way, to do the vec mac um, macro. But I, I'm actually citing towards that because um, I, macros cause problems to Clippy in some places. It's unable to um, detect the ins internals of a macro. So I if there's a non-macro solution that's not too ugly, I'd rather use that. Okay, so here um, it's vec new again. Let's just put that in the clipboard. Just a few left to hit. One more, one more. I missed it, where is it? It's up here, it's right here. All right. Okay, Builders has problems. All right. So this one's server side. Here we can just assume there shouldn't be a trailer because the client shouldn't send a message until the handshake completes, right? So I think it's safe to leave the trailer out there. Okay, these are the tests, right? Okay, there's more of them. Yeah, so that... This should be... Make unit tests in WebSocket... Well, WebSockets both WebSocket and Builder modules that test receiving a trailer after finishing a client handshake. Exactly. Um, this I can maybe do a s multiple cursor. Yes, yeah, some of them. Some of them. Okay, three more. Two more. One more. Boom. Everyone's happy, right? No. Actually, I can just go to um, problems here. No problems. No problems is good. Okay, so then um, we can just try again then, right? We can try again. Run Autobahn. That's unexpected. Yeah, we got the same thing, right? So did it not process that trailer... Well, I expected to at least try to process something. Um, let's let's do printf debugging, old school. So that was in um try receive frames, right? Trailer, yes. So let's have it print something here. Uh, trailer. length blah let's have the debug actually if the debug should include the length right so if i just say it's that and try again so it should actually show us what the trailer was oh there it is that looks correct because that's um that's the number right there right there's actually a null at the end why'd they do that they null terminated their string? Or is that something else? That's 81 hex, which is a text frame with one fragment. And that's the length 3. And then there's the 3. Oh, there's a 136. What's that? Is that a close? Hold on. Where's my calculator? 
What's the 136? 88. I think that's a close. So they send us the number and close right away. But still, we should have processed the text message. It should not have um, disconnected prematurely. We should have gotten the message. So what happened here? Oh, I see what happened. It waited for more bytes and never got them. So um, this needs more input should be false if the... So this should be... Um, it's only true if, if the assembly buffer is empty. If it's not empty, then we shouldn't try to receive more. We should just um, try to interpret it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, run. I picked up the yeah, 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 yeah thing from someone. Oh, look, it worked. There are 249 test cases. All right. Hex 88 is not part of the basic alpha. It's part of the framing, Endorn. We can, I can show you here. Um, actually, I can't show you here. We don't need this anymore, right? Maybe I'll keep it around just for giggles. Continue without saving. Yes, that's what I want. Um, we have to. I have to refer you to the RFC in Chapter Five, the data framing. So um, these first two bytes are have encoded fields in them, so they're not going to be ASCII. The payload is ASCII if it's or it's UTF-8 if it's a text message. So. Um, those first two bytes, like I said, um, that's 81 hex. That means the fin bit is set and the opcode is 1, which means that it's a text frame. This second message here of, um, well, this, this 3 is the length, right? Uh, which is th this payload length. So which means this is saying single fragment message of text. This is length 3 bytes. Here are the 3 bytes, which is... Um, the string 249 in um, in characters, 249. And so that means that that's the end of the first message. This is the first one message. And then there's a second message stuffed in there. So 136 is 88 hex, which is fin bit set opcode 8. And then the length is 0, so there's no payload. And 8 opcode is a cl connection close. Yeah. So there you go. I have uh, hand decoded two WebSocket messages. And I don't need to print out the trailer anymore. I should also run my tests. Just to make sure I didn't break anything elsewhere. Yay, we pass. Oh, you got it, Endorn. I love explaining things. In fact, I love explaining things so much, I over-explain. Okay, so I'm happy because we actually got the test count out, and so we can move on, right? Um, I'm going to want to refactor this because there's a lot of stuff here that has to do with just getting the connection that I'm going to want to abstract away. In fact, maybe I should do that first because after we get the um, number of test cases, we're going to be connecting again, right? Quite frequently. We're going to reconnect for every test case because what they do after getting the case count is they loop through and then they run a test case and running the test case consists of yet again connecting again but with a different URL. And um, and this time, we're going to be looping. So I think what we ultimately want to do is split this into two things. First, get the WebSocket, and then if we get it, then in the case of getting the, um, the count, it's just doing that, right? So let's split it. I'm just going to split it by duplicating it first and having one call the other. All right, so just conceptually, what we want to do is... We want to get a WebSocket out of this, right? WebSocket equal um, connect client, and it might give me an error, right? But if we don't get an error, then we're just doing this, right? Okay, so then I need connect is this guy. And he's going to return not a use size this time, but a WebSocket. It's WebSocket. Actually, I can import. I'm okay importing that one. WebSocket or a client builder. Okay. So then connect does all this junk until it gets down to here, right? 
And we probably don't need to print these anymore. And we don't need that because it's obvious that the only thing it does is do the handshake. If we get down to the end, it's um, OK. WebSocket. It's not, we don't even need to mutate it. Easy. Easy clap. Okay, what's wrong here? Um, oh, I need to await it. Because it's asynchronous. And then this needs to be mutable. Boom. Hey there, Cthulhu. I'm doing really well. I'm getting stuff working. Look at this. I can run my Autobahn client, and it talks to an Autobahn fuzz server, and tells me that there are 249 test cases. That server is running on a Docker instance on my Linux box. And if you would like more information on what the heck this is, just check out, check out the Autobahn test suite. So over the last couple of years, people have said, why don't you test your WebSocket stuff with the Autobahn test suite? And I'm like, okay, I'll do that sometime. And I never got to it. I'm getting to it today. So the awesome people behind Autobahn give you a Docker image, which you run it like this. And it basically runs a web server you can connect to it and test your WebSocket code with it. Hey there, Strihex. How are you today? And also, hello, of course, to Ant Cthulhu. Was implementing WebSockets difficult? It was for me because I'm doing it in Rust. The first implementation I did in C++ was pretty easy, but that was like two years ago. The protocol itself, I essentially went over it just now with this framing diagram. It's super simple. Conceptually, the hard part for me was getting it done in Rust. Yeah, I'm... The, uh, I talked about it in my Discord, but I got really hung up on a problem where I um, wanted to use an asynchronous mutex inside of the implementation for the stream type. So if you know what I'm talking about in Rust with the stream type, it is um, a poll interface. So there's this thing called poll next, right? And you're given a pinned, a pinned self reference and a context and um, I've, I've worked around the problem by not using a mutex at all. Now instead I use an MPSC unbounded receiver. Multi-producer, single consumer, unbounded receiver. A lot of complicated words there. But basically it's a Q unbounded, meaning that it'll, it'll, it doesn't have a maximum limit to the number of things that could be in it at one time. So it's there's practically unbounded. Well, it's theoretically unbounded, but practically bounded by how much memory you can allocate. And then um, you can have many copies of the sender, multiple producers, in other words. So you can have many things sending in messages, but only a single consumer. So there should be only one holder of the receiver. And um, that type is implemented by the futures crate. And I just needed to forward the context to its pull next on pin, and then it does, it does the rest of the work. But before I did this, I was trying to like manage the context myself and add a waker and then call that waker. And then all, the whole, pr whole thing was protected by an asynchronous mutex, and I couldn't for the life of me figure out how to lock the mutex and hold on to the guard for the mutex in such a way that we could re-enter poll next and have the guard on the second call. I, it, it, I got into weird lifetime problems. <laughs> I gave up on it. It's in my Discord if someone would like to teach me how to do it right. Um, the original implementation was like, maybe 15 lines of code and there's a there's a it worked as long as you could get the mutex if you couldn't get the mutex it would drop it and then you would never wake up i was wondering about automon and just explained it yeah that's what we're we're trying to leverage their test suite 22 hours left on my stream yeah as if maybe on a weekend sometime that's what the prime engine did last weekend and i was thinking yeah the only time i could probably ever pull off a 24-hour stream would be on a weekend where I don't need to go anywhere. Sounds like C++ all right. <laughs> this is definitely not C++. This is very, very hairy underpinning of Rust. You have to understand a lot of concepts with just these um, nine lines of code, right? Stream is a convention in Rust where you are getting a sequence asynchronously. So it acts like an asynchronous iterator. And asynchronous, at the um, root of it, you see poles with 
contexts and pinned pointers or pinned references. And so you have to understand the concepts of pinning and polling with a context and all of that around the, 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 um, the, the convention of stream being an iterator. So it has an item. So there's just a, a ton of things you have to, you have to learn first before this makes any sense at all. You meant C++ refusing something mutex and crashing into oblivion. Oh no, it was, it was, it was still rust, but it was my problem where I dropped the guard. If you drop, if you basically, whenever you do this, this poll, in any kind of way, like you do poll ready, poll next on pin, you're giving it a context which allows it to wake you up when it's ready, right? But if the thing you polled, you, if you were to drop that, you'll never get woken up because they're like, okay, well, the waker now um, is gone because you dropped the thing you were, you were waiting on. And so um, it'll never re-enter the poll because it assumes that um, the only time to re-enter poll is if you wake up and you only wake up if the waker is triggered, and that'll only happen if you held on to the thing that you pulled. So, and it, it's not something that I f found easily with a Google search. I found someone having a very similar, but not exactly the same problem. And um, the code is, um, you don't get warned by Clippy that you're dropping something. So it makes it extra hard to debug. I got, I've come to rely on the Rust compiler and Clippy letting me know if I'm done doing something wrong. And in the case of like dropping uh, something I pulled, I don't get any warning at all. So maybe in the future in Rust they'll add that, but not not right now. Okay, back to this. So I've refactored this uh, now get case count leverage as a connect that we can reuse. So now I can safely button this up saying, hey, we're done with connect. And um, we're gonna get the case count. Actually, you know what I'm, I, I can do? No, I was going to say wrap the error handling at a higher level, but I kind of want to catch the case count error out uh, first. And then once we know the number of cases, then we're going to going into a loop. And I think we're going to end up ignoring errors because that's what the um, tungstenite implementation does. They, um, oh no, they do handle errors. Okay, never mind. So I should wrap the error handling somewhere else. Let's put it all inside of a bit, another asynchronous function. They called this run tests, right? I need to call it something different because I don't want to be a copy a, a a copycat. I'm being rated by IBM developer. Ooh, hey there, IBM developer. I have never seen your stream before. What were you streaming today? Thank you for the raid. I am uh, working with the Autobahn test suite today. Please feel free to ask me any questions. I've been learning Rust, and I ported a library that implements WebSockets to Rust, and I am um, now employing the Autobahn test suite, which you can check out here. It's a nifty little thing that is open source where a Docker image they provide you, you run it, and then it sets up a what they call a fuzzing server, and then you can connect your WebSocket client code to that server, and it will automatically start sending you messages that you're supposed to echo back, and then the server tells you at the end whether you passed all the tests or not. So I have gotten to the point now where we can get the number of test cases from the server uh, using my own WebSocket type, which um, the uh, I'll go over a little bit because... All you wonderful folks who just rated are coming into the middle of it. Essentially, I have two types, a builder for a, for a client end of a WebSocket, and then the WebSocket itself, which we get out of the builder when we finish opening here, right? The convention for opening up a WebSocket as a client is you first start with a HTTP request. We fill in the URL, and it's a WS instead of an HTTP. If it was um, secure sockets, it would be two S's. But anyway, we're only going to a local thing on our network, so we don't need transport layer security, although we could use it if we wanted. Uh, we are going to fetch that request and expect that it will be upgraded to the WebSocket protocol. So what we should get back is a response with a status code of 101 and, and some upgrade information. And that un upgrade information consists of a underlying TCP connection and a trailer, 
which was very important because we had a, a bug. It turns out that the fuzzing server, when it gives us the response, right after the response, they tack on the message. So this, these last bytes at the bottom uh, are easier to see if I show you my terminal where we printed them out here. So I had a bug where I um, basically read the response back and then did the switch to WebSockets. And so it dropped all these extra bytes, which I call the trailer. So it dropped the trailer. And unfortunately, the trailer contained a text message here and a close that we needed to process. So once we got the um, trailer to be interpreted, we um, read that as a text message. And we now know that there are 249 tests on the, on the server. Yeah, it's Wireshark, yes. Print the trailer as hex data, yeah. I was I just did that with a debug statement. So the debug statement for a vector of U8s is you just it prints them in decimal. So there's probably a, a way to do it in hex and Dorn, but I just don't know how to do it. <laughs> I deleted that line of code anyway, so now we're not printing that. Um, so if I run it again, um, it just tells me the 249 test cases. Free and open source. As free as you can get, yeah. Oh, the King of Clubs. The King of Clubs, thank you for the Twitch Prime. I appreciate that. What is the, the terminology for Wireshark? Wireshark... Uh, what terminology under Wireshark are you talking about? Package... Oh, you're t talking about what is the general kind of tool that it is? I, I like to think of it as a, diagnos a network diagnostic tool. So you can look at traffic on your network, on any network interface. The only thing it really can't do for you is track the, the loopback or the local host interface. But I'm connecting between my Win Win Windows machine and my Linux machine, so they have different IP addresses, so I can actually capture the traffic with Wireshark. And um, I put in a filter there so you don't see my, um, my stream traffic and see my IP address. Uh, I had to be really careful about that. Um, but it really helps to um, see what's going under the hood. So we can see the, um, the actual handshake. So this is what we send to the server. And these two headers here are very important. This is how we prove that we understand the WebSocket protocol. You have to say it's version 13 that we understand, and here's a key. And what the server does in its response is it gives you a corresponding accept. And the accept has to match the, the, um, the result of taking the key and running it through a, a hash. Um, the... Um, HTTP protocol is used to get the WebSocket. So we start with a TCP connection. We, we send HTTP traffic over that TCP connection. But as part of HTTP, there's a mechanism called the protocol upgrade. So if you put the upgrade token in the connection header, and you have an upgrade header that mentions a, a protocol by name, and then that is on both the request and the response, and you get a special status code of uh, 101, then you lift up the connection out of HTTP and to something else. And that something else is defined by what you agreed on. In this case, it's WebSocket. So at, at the moment that the last byte of the response is sent, all the rest of the bytes, these uh, few down here, I think there were um, seven of them, seven bytes here, are a different protocol. They're no longer HTTP. And unfortunately, Wireshark is not smart enough to see that. I was expecting that it would... It, be more obvious. It should say H to H hypertext transport transfer protocol, and then it should have said WebSocket protocol, and let us pull apart those um those packets. I bet if it had more to say, we would see the actual WebSocket protocol there. Let me catch up with chat. In a less appropriate way, packet sniffer. Yeah, that's a way to sniff packets. Can you sniff remote packets? You can only sniff packets that arrive on your or that leave or enter your network interface. So if you set up your network interface to what's called promiscuous mode, then you would maybe see packets that are meant for other computers on your local network. Um, you usually you don't see traffic even in promiscuous mode if it doesn't even hit your um, local switch, like if it's going to some other um, sub network or you know other network, you won't see it. You, so if you connect to a Microsoft site, you could see packets that you send to Microsoft and the packets that they send you. And that's probably pretty much it. That's how they cheat on web games. Trying to, um, that's, that's one way you could do it if the traffic is not encrypted. 
but if try, try it with uh, HTTPS, for example, and you'll see the only thing Wireshark will be able to tell you is, hey, there was a transport layer security handshake here. And then after that, I don't know what it is. It's all encrypted to me. It all looks like garbage. <laughs> yeah, so for an HTTPS connection, there would be an extra handshake at the front to do the transport layer security. And then the contents of the actual um, HTTP would be encrypted. So you wouldn't see any of that. The most you would see is you'd see the IP address and the host name that we're connecting to because that's part of the header of the TLS. I can do it later if I get to it and show you. Or you can try it out for yourself. Um, that's what you would want too. So if anyone could sniff HTTPS traffic and recover it, then it's not secure, is it? So yeah, the max you can get is you can see the key exchange happen, but since each side holds onto a secret key they never send, you won't be able to interpret the data once they've uh, exchanged the keys, the public keys, that is. Definitely want cheating tools. Yeah, so um, people de can develop cheating tools if they somehow reverse engineer the protocol, or if the protocol, and which is made easier if the protocol is not encrypted, right? Or if there's a way to... Um, like pl add a plug-in or inject some code into the game itself. Anyway, yeah. Uh, something like Wireshark would be one of the first things you try to say, hey, can I see the traffic at all? And then you say, oh, well, I can't because it's encrypted. And then you throw away Wireshark and move on to something else. Anyway, if you guys have any questions, let me know. I'm going to move on, though. This generic connect thing for WebSocket, I can reuse this, right? And I'm going to make... Oh, right. I wanted to ex extract out the error the um, error handling from the main function here. I wanted to call it, let's say, um, run tests. Although it's, it's very much the same as what Tungstenite chose. <laughs> yeah, they toss any error they get from get case count, actually. I'm being better about it and printing it. Uh, anyway, so run tests, I don't think we need anything right because yeah it's just going to return a result and uh, we don't need the result thank you for the follow by the way looks like javascript but not there are elements of a lot of different programming languages here i don't know the language but i've heard that rust is inspired a lot by ocaml and haskell and there are also a lot of similarities to c and other languages like c sharp use similar constructs for things like the question mark operator in in uh, c sharp it's different it's um the um the early return on error the the short circuit this this question mark turns into a lot of code which basically says if the thing before the question mark was an error alternative then return it otherwise unpack the success code out of the result and return it so this websocket here is a WebSocket if connect, which returns a result WebSocket or an error, is a success. If it's a failure, it takes that error and returns it back out. So it's really handy when your functions return results, you can um, have them, um, you don't have to have, like, if an error occurred at this step, return early. If it happened somewhere else, return early. You can just do question mark and move on. It's really nice. Oh, good luck with your class, and thank you again, a King of Clubs, for the sub. I really appreciate that. I'll wave to you on the way out. Have an awesome class today. Question mark, exactly. It's like catch with superpowers, yes. It's like catch and rethrow in a sense. Because if it's saying if there's an error, we, we want to pass it up. Pass the buck. It's the pass the buck operator. It also un unwraps the wrapper. So we don't have to constantly do unwrap. Like Tungstenite had to do the unwrap at this point. I don't have to do that because I'm actually handling errors and unwrapping at the same time with the nifty versatile question mark unwrap rethrow what you call it. <laughs> okay, I think what I want to do is pull pull a bulk of this in here. Except for the error handling, we want to Oh, we don't need no also the executor block on we remove, right? because that's going to be the job of the main. So it's just going to be that colon, or semicolon, right? Because um, there's no, no match needed. 
and we have to do something at the end, so it's... Let's just say we have to do the rest of the tests. Okay, this... Uh, we need to await that, because it's asynchronous. That's the other wrinkle I'm just kind of throwing in here that I might not mention all the time is, when you have this keyword async in front of your functions, this means the return value isn't technically a result. It's a future type that will, when completed, give you a result output. And you can see that if I don't do the await here, and I hover over the cases, it'll say it's something... That's what impl means. It's something that implements the trait future where the re output is a result which, if successful, gives you a unsized integer or un un unsigned integer. Otherwise, it gives you an error. So there's a lot, there's, that's a mouthful, right? Um, you can, s it's like, where did that future come from, right? The, um, oh, where did it go? Where did this future come from? The future came from using the async keyword. So it's roughly the equivalent, if you didn't have the keyword there, it's roughly the equivalent to saying impl future that. Problem is with Rust syntax, you can't actually say that because impl isn't allowed in, um, in the return value slot. <laughs> oh, actually, no, it's because we don't have that, right? But it's going to say ultimately that um, you can't put it in the return value slot. Or something like that. Anyway, um, I don't I don't have the syntax quite right, but um, that async is syntactic sugar for hiding a lot of details behind the fact that we're not returning the result immediately. We're only returning it after you wait for it. That's what await does. Await is saying complete this feature before moving on. And the way it works inside, you can only do it inside another async function. Or if you are not in an async function, you have to have some executor. And the executor block on function is a simple one. It says, take the thread that I'm on and just block until this feature is complete. And the block in that thread consists of trying to complete the feature and then sitting there and waiting to be woken up if you have to wait. Um, but there are more elaborate executors in Rust, of course. You could farm it out to a thread pool. You could give it to Tokyo's reactors, all this other junk, right? Anyway, um... That's what, in a nutshell, what async... I've already ex exceeded the number of over-explanations I'm allowed to do in one, in one hour, haven't I? So main, I want it to just be run the tests and do that inside of an executor and if we get an error printed out. So that's what I want to do. Just, just run the tests. If you get an error printed, otherwise we're not going to get anything. So do nothing. And we don't need to print. And I don't even need, actually, um, they don't need that return, because we don't do anything else. Yes, so then this should not have broken anything. Should still run. Uh-oh. It panicked, not yet. Oh, right. We did get the number, but I have a to-do. If you hit a to-do at runtime, you get a not yet implemented. We hit our to-do there. Make main fallible. You want, oh, that's right. Good opportunity for me to do that. Thank you, Sarian. So Sarian earlier, or is it Silmuth? I, you Rust experts, I would get you confused. You were saying that I can actually do this, and it would print it for me, right? So I wouldn't actually have to do this match, conceivably. I could um, just do that, and we would get something. Let's see what that does. Hey there, Futter Stuffle. How are you doing today? Let's see what happens, since I have no idea what, ha what happens if you return something that's fallible. Okay, that's a panic. I, I want it to be not a panic. I need to manufacture an error. I know. I will just mess up the URL. Um, that was where... Oh, wait. I, the URL should have been here, right? Not inside here, so let's pass that in. Hmm... URI, URI, and then um, that is what we're going to put out here, and use it there. All right, 
So then I can button this back up and just hack the URI to be in incorrect. So we'll just put an X in front. Actually, I'm going to do better than that. I'm going to have it connect to something that's the, the server's not there. Wrong port number, right? Watched a file earlier today. I think it was 326 or at least something close. Kept connecting that you were uh, co commenting that I was over-explaining. Oh, the number of times that I commented that I was over-explaining. So I over-talk about over-explaining. <laughs> Makes a good or even greater teacher. Oh, thank you, Cthulhu. It does. Oh, well, I try to keep a balance. Okay, so it actually did what I hoped it, it would do. It actually just, um, you know, spat out the error that we got. And we got that it didn't exit successfully. Oh, that's actually really nice. It actually filled in an, an exit code for us. Did you see that? Look at that. It gave me an exit code of one automatically. I didn't have to do that. All right, cool. So then if I remove the to-do and I simply say okay here, I just want to check what is a successful re return from main do. Oh, nice. The error up is not too pretty. That's okay. Um, if we wanted something pretty, we could have... Um, just printed it ourselves, right? I don't really care. We get the um, connection refused in there, and we know it's at the HTTP layer. That's all I really care about. So we're going to keep it. All right, let's move on. After we get the case count, now we're going to do for i in one to, to inclusive cases. And we're supposed to call connect again, right? Right, we're going to do this kind of stuff here. Actually, why don't I just do it in another function? Run test. And we're going to borrow the client and just provide the case number. So, case, use size. Result. Uh, we don't care about any successful value for the return if it's a, uh, but we do want to get an error. All right, so part of what I'm doing, why there are a stream of words constantly coming forth from my mouth, is what's called rubber ducking. So I'm explaining what I'm doing as I'm doing it, as if I was talking to a rubber duck. In this case, I'm talking to you, fine people, but the term comes from talking to a rubber duck as a way to verify that you know what you're doing. If you can explain what you're doing to anyone, whether a real person or not, then it helps validate that uh, you understand it. If you didn't understand it and you tried to explain it, you would catch yourself. You'd be like, oh, wait, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. So in other streams, we've heard this. Other people like Adam had an emote for it. I don't have one. Maybe I should add one. I don't know. I, I do rubber docking all the time. So that's why uh, you hear me putting into English as best I can the code I just wrote. All right, and so in this case, running a test consists of connecting basically the same kind of thing we're doing to get the case count, right? Only the resource we request is something else, which I don't know yet. And um, when if we get a connection, we're supposed to loop until it closes on us, right? So we're going to loop and say... Um, actually, no, I don't need a loop because the WebSocket is a stream. I can just say, say WS for each right for each message uh match the message because it depends on what kind of message we get right and then um we once we get to the end we're okay right if we get to the end without an error i think that's what we want all right now what are the different kinds of message okay hold on why do i get an error here um what Oh, these need to be asynchronous. Right. So async. Like that. Cool. All right. Uh, I need to put something in here that makes sense, though. It uh, borrows the message, so I need to say move. Move that message in there. Okay, missing arms. That's, all, that's fine. We can miss arms. Uh, let me do this outer one first. Basically, I just want to run the test... I and it may might er, have an early return, right? That's all I want. And why is this a problem? 
Mismatch types. Expected a result found a unit. Uh, say what again? Found a unit type. Oh, because of the semicolon. I, I do that all the time, right? Uh, is this something else? No, it's something else. I do sometimes, like if you put a semicolon here, this becomes a problem because this is what you intended to return. If you make it into a statement with a semicolon, it consumes that value, and then you have nothing. So you can fix that in one of two ways. You can do the traditional return, or you can do what Clippy suggests here, since it's unneeded, you can just have that value be a, a tail to your function. Hey there, Mr. Balrog and Nightshade Dude. And Ultramark. Hello. And develop it, hello. A lot of people just arrived. And thank you for all the follows. Let me get some waves out of the way. I missed waving to some people about 10, 20 minutes ago. I'm sorry about that. Dr. Maruku, hello. Uh... I'm just going to say Lai, because I don't know how to pronounce your name. Lai. And Gurutoro. Where's Gurutoro's text? I, did, I missed it. Oh, when we're talking about Wireshark. Got it. Hold on. I must, must wave to people. Missing client param. Oh, yeah, you're right. Thank you, Strihex. You're one step ahead of me, which means you earn a point. Yes, it needs to get the client, right? And it needs to borrow the client. And what else did I do wrong here? Oh, I need to await it. Yeah, I constantly do that wrong, right? No, that's not it. It's something else here. Something else. Something I'm doing wrong. Is case is the right type? The U size. So I is a U size. Mismatch types. Expected in a result. Found unit. Oh, because of that? Right. So we need to say OK. Yeah, so missing things like that and like having an extra semicolon throws me off all the time. Forgetting to do um, the await here is bad because you didn't, um, because it's actually re not returning a result, it's actually returning a future result. So it actually, if now that I'm down to that, it'll say that, that yeah, you just have to start to recognize that when it says you use question mark for something that is ultimately a future, that means you forgot to do an await first. Because you didn't want to, to do the try on the future, you want to do a try on the result after the future completes. So this becomes a yield point. In other words, this is a place where this function might temporarily get suspended and we run some other task if we had any, and then we get back to it once um, we get signal to, to continue again. For loops don't return anything, your function wants a result. Yeah, that's why we needed the OK here. Another way to do this would, a nifty way using iterators would be um, one dot dot cases for each. case run test client case dot await question mark right um one of these needs to be async i think yes so i can't get rid of that oh wait no we're in an async block oh but this closure needs to be async yes which means i need to do that. Um, is it is it the move problem again? No, it's the unit problem again, because I got rid of my OK. And this is a problem because the question marks in the wrong place, or it needs to be out here. I forget. No, the question mark definitely... Oh, this is a problem, isn't it? I... need to do a try for each. And then that pulls in... That we need another crate... I need another... Um, what's it telling me? Add a turbo fish? We don't need a turbo fish. 
Try for each is one of those that we need a, a trait for, right? Oh, uh, hold on. Um, I need another await. Oh, Actually, I don't need this async, do I? Okay, I'm missing something. So someone's probably already told told me. Hey there, Congress. See, I get myself into trouble by trying to use the um, iterator pattern too much, but it is sort of nifty. If once I get this to work, though. Okay, it's again the tries not. So that means I needed to do an early return, right? And then the whole thing is an issue because of why. Can only be. Oh, I didn't do an await. And are we down to something else now? Hold on, I don't understand that one. Run t oh, I forgot another await. Well, no, I thought try for each took futures. Oh, it doesn't. Okay, I, I need to, I guess I need to look that up again. I forgot how, I forgot the semantics of this. So that's in um, futures, right? Try for each. Attempts to run this stream to completion, executing the provided asynchronous closure. Okay, so this is not an asynchronous closure. I need to make it asynchronous. And that needs to be having a weight in there, right? Okay, I don't understand this. What's their example? Do I just need to remove the await here? No, that's not right. I don't need to have it this async, do I? They don't have an async in there. <laughs> you could use future stream iter to turn the iterator into a stream. I just want to get this, I, I want to get my understanding correct here. The, the Me hitting this error and not knowing what to do means um, I need to correct my brain. My understanding of try for each is not exactly correct. The return value is a feature whose output is a result. Right, so we got this part correct. Because we're going to wait for that future, and then we get a result, and then we're going to early... Actually, I don't even need to early return. I can just do that. Right? You need to Twitch to see a lot of people in here writing in Rust. Why is it so popular? I am not sure exactly why it got popular in Twitch. I just know that I didn't see Rust mentioned for a couple of years and then all of a sudden I started seeing people more and more people interested in it. I think maybe it's just an interest in the language increasing in general and so it's just making its way into all sorts of forums. So for me the why rust was that people just started asking me about what I thought about it, suggested I learn it and that kind of thing and then I got into it and I really enjoy it. So for me personally I'm only writing it because I'm finding it to be a hell of fun. And when um I actually have a, a nice, uh, if I hit the right button, I have a nice, um, if I hit the right button, what I like about Rust, I have a nice summary here. Compiler and the language are very strict and rigorous, which m leads to code that usually just works once I get it to compile. You feel really good when you get it to compile. There are a lot of like new things in the language that make it really... I don't know what's the word, um, really um, pleasant to use. Like there's built-in unit testing, built-in code formatting. There are no macros or header files to worry about. Built-in package management, uh, built-in linter, uh, built-in cross-platform. You don't have to worry about if you're on Linux or Windows. I literally took my WebSocket stuff yesterday and and it ran on on linux and i had i didn't all the development was done on windows and i just ran on linux worked the first time 
<laughs> I'm like, wow, that was incredibly easy. Whereas with C++, I always still have to worry about, okay, what's the compiler on Linux? Now when I use that compiler, oh, this compiler has warnings and errors I didn't see with Microsoft's compiler. But uh, yeah, Rust is just, yeah. But then to be balanced, I like to balance this out because I don't want to be a fanboy. So I have the, um, my not favorite features. So these are just something, most of them are just things you have to get used to. There are peculiarities of the language. Maybe they're just because of how the community has grown. That's what, what that community prefers. So they like the sizes of integers to be kind of ingrained in the name. They like snake case for um, a lot of things. Um, they they like very terse names like mutt rc. So this is mutable reference counted str uh, string slice vector function. But instead you see really terse names, except for cow because we love cows. Um, there are some peculiarities like some functions like this one I'm using here. You you don't get it at all unless you do a um, use future stream extension. Like it, you just can't get it unless you do that. Um, you, and you have to know what thing to pull in. Sometimes the linter will tell you a suggestion. Hey, you'll get that function if you pull in this trait. But a lot of times, it, uh, um, either it doesn't or I haven't learned how to see that. Um, there are lots of different string types. And th so this gets really confusing because you'll see str and you'll think it's a string. But really, it's a string slice. And that means something different. Um, and yeah, there are certain things that are just really really difficult especially because the book hasn't been written yet like we're talking about i'm using asynchronous closures right and there is a rust if you look it up the rust async book there's a book about asynchronous rust but when you get down to chapter 6.3 they haven't written it yet so if someone would like to please write the chapter 6.3 so i could read it that would be awesome <laughs> So yeah, um, I found this out. The, I found this out the hard way. By um, it looks like a really awesome book talking about how to do asynchronous Rust, and then we're going really well, and we get down to six two, and we're like, yeah, this is great. And then okay, next chapter gone. And I'm like, what? So um, yeah, and then some of these are like barely filled in, and or they'll say like to do, like we're going to add stuff later. Yeah, so. Um, that's another thing I'm not in my favorite is that they really haven't finished the learning material online about it. Uh, plus side, I guess you can consider since it's all open source, if you feel like finishing the book, you could only a little over two years since 1.0. Yeah. So it's a relatively young language. Hey there, lazy guru. How are you today? And Radon90, hello. How are you? And also hello to uh, W. Clay. Deckerning and Razor X. Moo. Not pretty surprising for that. Yeah, it's a relatively new language. That might be also another answer for why Rust has been um, coming up a lot recently, is that it's a newer language and it's just gaining traction. Okay, so I still need to figure out what I'm doing wrong here. Trait bound future. So, the future doesn't implement try. That's why I can't wait for it, right? That's fundamentally what I'm doing wrong. No, the return value is a future. So I should be able to await for it. So, did I just not hit save here? Why is it saying... Oh, is it that... No, that... Hmm. I don't get it. The future I need to give the, the this closure needs to do what? So right now the closure is it should be returning a future of that. Is that what we're supposed to do? F takes a self okay. Is that it? This needs to take an okay. So case is a sum. No, case is a use size here. The try for each is from iterator, not from stream extension. So am I looking at the wrong one then? <gasps> oh, you're right, Saryan. You probably were trying to tell me that like 10 minutes ago, weren't you? You said that try for each is coming from standard iterator trade, not from futures. Okay. So how many points should I give Saryan then? 
I should probably give Sarian like three points for that. All right, so then the this thing is this I'm trying to use ex, a um, a function available from the try stream extension trait, which I actually never even pulled in. That's probably why it didn't complain about it because I'm using the wrong one. But eventually we're going to want to use the try stream extension trait, and but I'm trying to use that with something that's not a stream. I need to turn to turn that into a stream, like what Sarian was trying to tell me. And you said I could do that by using future stream iter. Is that what we want to do? Or do I want to do something different here? I guess we do, right? So it would be... Um, futures... It's futures, right? Stream... Iter. And I have to give it an iterator. Is that sufficient? Okay, cool. Um, almost there. What's it trying to tell me with this? Okay, there's a use that I'm missing. So I guess I pulled in the wrong one. It's going to tell me which one. Futures try stream. I thought that's what I pulled in. Try stream extension. Hmm. I did put the the use. Why doesn't it want me? Why doesn't it like it? The train bounds were not satisfied. Oh, do I need to do an iter? No, I shouldn't have to, right? On the range. I guess I can try though. Um, do I need to do like this dot iter? Wait, can you do an into iter? Okay, that it wasn't it. Hmm. Okay, I don't get it. <laughs> I did the use. Why doesn't it accept it? Just because this might be a problem. Let me um exit that out. No, that's not it. Hmm. It has to do with the f with the closure I'm giving it, probably right. Oh, right. I was looking at that before. Yeah, you're right. Sarian's right. It's it's in here that the function I'm supposed to provide is supposed to take an OK, which is a... Um, where do they define the what the OK is? I don't know what... But you're supposed to wrap your input with OK. So we need to do that. One of those oddities. I ran into that before and I forgot. Yeah, you're right. So for some reason, maybe it's to keep parity in the types because you get uh, a result out, right? You get you get an out you get a result out. So they figure to keep parity between input and output, the input should also be a result, but it doesn't make sense to feed an error as input, so you should just always feed an OK as an input. So that means you take your input items and you wrap them with into OKs. So instead of a one, two, three, four, five sequence, in actuality what that map does is now we get a sequence of this instead. Okay. Because try for each wants to see that, not that. And then what it's going to give us back out is either OKs or errors. Or it's going to give us a single OK or an error based on um, if any of these was an error, which is exactly what I want. That's why, that's why I wanted to use the try for each. Because that basically says take all these test cases and try running run test on them, but we if we get a test failure we want to stop because that's exactly well it is exactly what auto what um tungstenite does they do the same thing in um oh no they don't they catch the error and move on maybe i should do the same thing so not do try for each but 
toss the error? Will it do the error macro? What does that do? I forgot what that does. What is the error? Can I look that up? Where would that be? Probably in standard rest. Is there an error macro? Can you look it up like that? Uh, is it this one? No. This one? No. Might be from the log crate. Yeah, who knows what they're using. We'd have to look and see. Oh, yeah. There you go. Sarian's right. I don't know what it does. I'm assuming from the context here that because we're not returning anything from main and I don't see any kind of uh, break that they are continuing on. So we should probably just do the same. So I don't want the try. So all that effort to use try for each and we don't actually want it. <laughs> but we still will do an iterator. And then um, uh, the convention here changes, right? Because for each wants something that's synchronous, I, th I believe. Okay, I need to look it up. I still haven't memorized this stuff. For each. Okay, so it just wants me to eat the error then. So we'll, we'll just say let that equal run test. Or... Oh, the whole thing has to be... Um, Synchronous, so that means I want to handle the error at this point. Oh, wait, wait. I will want to internally handle the error, won't I? So this won't return a uh, result. So we won't do that. And, oh, but what about that? Shoot. Wrap the whole thing, I guess. Uh, how about we have an outer and an inner? Actually, then I might as well just put the outer one here. Yeah, so let's just do it here. Let, well, if, let. I just want to do what they do, maybe? They do a match, right? Oh, and they um, accept certain errors, so maybe we should do the same thing. Yeah, 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 match. Let's do the arms here, so error. Uh, let's just say we don't, let's just print the error here. The print line, I had a more sophisticated way of doing this in Rover, didn't I? Where we actually, well, because I don't know any other way of doing it, so it's as sophisticated as I can make it. Okay, rid this Rover. I had this match source thing. Like... Could I please put that in my clipboard? Yes, please. Thank you. No. Paste. That. Comma. Okay. Nothing. Uh, I need to await it then. Which ne means the whole thing needs to be async. I uh, did something wrong here. Uh, probably because... Why? I don't know. It's expecting an error. Uh, what's expecting an error? Run test? Match await. I don't know what I'm doing wrong here. Did I forget brackets somewhere? I probably did. I don't see it though. Oh, is it the this final one? Yeah, this shouldn't return an error. No, it would return it. Right, so here it's gonna be okay if we get this part. That's probably what it is, right? No? No there. Okay. This is a problem why. 
It borrows case. Uh, let's not borrow case. But now it's going to borrow client, which I don't want. So let's let it, um, let's let client equal borrow client. And then I don't need to do that. There we go. Little tricks to, to work around uh, moving things into asynchronous blocks. Because it's going to be used more than once, you can't um, move a, um, you can't, you can't move something in there and then borrow it. So if you borrow it outside, what you're doing is you're just um, copying the the uh, the reference, which you can do because it's immutable. Hey there, Ereld. I'd run into so much trouble if this was an immutable reference, by the way. Look at that. More trouble. It's going to say that um, it can't be copied, which it's correct. Uh, oh, someone else I need to say hi to. Who I missed. And I'm looking for their chat now. Oh, that was a while ago. David PD, RSN. Rust went 1.0 in 2015, so that's only... Only five years ago. <laughs> I guess it's taken a while. Oh, there's a little reflection above my head. It's taken a while for the language to catch on. But now that it's starting to catch on, we're seeing more of it. And hello, by the way. Uh, do I take a break to get rid of that reflection? I need to use the restroom anyway. How about I set a little bit of a break? Not that long, though. Like two minutes? I'll be right back. I'm back, and there's still a little bit of fuzz on my camera. Hold on. Mm. It's bill protection. Yeah, a little, adjusting a little bit of things here and there. All right, that's fine. Looks like your name is David Peterson with all the vowels removed from your last name. Just occurred to me. Okay, this is working. And it will, it's sort of gross, but it's going to take all the test case numbers, turning it into a stream in order to do for each on it. You know, then, is this really necessary? I don't think we need to turn it into a stream anymore. I could just do an iterator for each, and this doesn't need to be asynchronous anymore, right? Let me see. It would look a little bit cleaner if I did it that way. So if I did um, that for each, then this doesn't need to be asynchronous anymore, right? Um, where is the? Is it, it's this. It's this one, right? Ah. This part does need to be asynchronous, so back, 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 and then remove that. And await that. Wow, 
Wait. Um, oh, I put the uh, weight in the wrong one, wrong spot. Um, okay. Oh, no, I already had no weight there. Wait a second. No, that weight was in the right spot, wasn't it? Oh, wait, no, we can't wait for the... Okay. So I, I can't do it that way. It has to be a stream because um, we, you can't... You can't use with iterators. This um, concept of waiting. But do I really need this async block here? Hmm. There's got to be a way to clean this up, right? It might be easier to go back to the for loop. I was hoping to make this clean and, and have it use the iterator pattern, but maybe you're right, Sarian. Well, it's good to explore these. So the non-iterator way would be for i in 1 to cases. And then we don't need this level, right? But I would still have this here. And case. Yeah, I guess so. I feel bad using a four in when, uh, I mean, uh, I won't get iterator points <laughs> by not using an iterator. All right, anyway, let's move on. So given a test, let's have it print out that we're running it. Test case blank out of blank. And which means I'm going to want to have the total cases. So this is case cases. Okay, now given a WebSocket, we want to consume each of its messages. Right, depending on what kind of message it is. So, um, what am I looking for? I'm looking for th th this. This kind of a format, right? Yes. Okay, I'll just fill in all the arms with to-dos for now. Actually, is there a way to auto-fill the arms? Ooh, there is. Neat. I love it. Okay. I don't actually don't want to format it yet because... Um, a lot of these we want the same, right? So for ping, pong, and close... No, just for ping and pong, we're supposed to just ignore them, right? For text and binary, we want to actually take the message and send it back. So, um... Oh, I can't do that unless I split this. Right, so let's split it. Uh, let uh, sync and stream. Is that how it works? Sync stream equals ws split. And then we do the stream for each. And then here we would do a sync. Uh, sync dot. Uh, what is it? What's the type of sync again? It is a split sync. Um. I think I need to pull in another extension, like the sync extension. Yeah, in order for IntelliSense to help me out here. Okay, there we go. So, um, it's just send, right? Send an item. So, I need to turn a stream message into a sync message. Web sockets... Sync... Uh, oh, it's not exported? Really? sync message it is exported but maybe not at the top level ah it's not now it is Wait, what did I change here huh I noticed a little bubble saying I had changed something alright so sync message text and we can just feed in the same message now that is a future, right? So I need to do a wait on it. Right, and then... Oh, uh, maybe not. 
expected a function. What? Uh, what? Oh, it was text. Ah, uh, text is a structure. So there's the payload, which is the message, and then there's the um, last fragment, which is last... Oh, that's another one of these enums that I didn't export. <laughs> last fragment. I um, am bool averse, so rather than saying, like, last fragment true here, I ended up making um, an enum for it. Don't hate me. <laughs> Uh, oh, the send can fail, right? So we need to say we don't care if it fails. Uh, that wasn't it. Can't move out of sync. Oh, right. To reuse it, I need to put it into, um, I need to get a, a reference to it. Does the send take a mutable? Yeah. So I need interior mutability. Whenever we have, like, we can't um mu we can't put the sync directly into the asynchronous closure we use with stream because um the the closure we give it is uh is a mutable closure and when you do that you can't um it's hard for me to explain but we can't put anything in there unless it's owned or no not even that we can't put anything in there unless it's copyable because every time it runs, you get another copy of it. So, um, because it's in the loop for each, right? So we can't copy a sync, and I can't copy a mutable reference to sync like I need to call send. So, but what I can do is I can say let sync equal ref cell new sync, and then we can um, get a reference to it. Uh, ref cell, I uh, will need to import that. That's use standard cell ref cell, right? Where did it move it? Right here? Right, so now I should be able to do this if I borrow it mutably. Cool. Now we're back to a warning. Okay, so there's an unused feature that must be used. I need to await it. Cool. So, need to handle errors, right? Uh, what do we get back out here? So, right, this is if we get an error trying to send a text back. I'm going to basically like drop the error if we get it. So, uh, so, I need the same thing with binary, right? Only the type is different. Oh, thank you for the follow. Okay, so there's binary. And then what do we do with a close? We wanted to return the close, right? Isn't that what is... Actually, I don't know what Tungstenite does. They... I remember seeing, yeah, that they ignore the close, but I think we should return the favor, right? I think we should return the favor. So it would be sync dot um, borrow mute dot send. I think I have a close in here. Close. Code reason dot await. And that can fail, so we're going to ignore that. The way I have this set up, when, when we send a close, that should terminate it. I think. Actually, I can't remember if we're supposed to send the close back or just close the sync. The other, yeah, so it might be that we need to do sync dot borrow mute dot. Um, close that returns the future doesn't it uh, I'm not hovering over the wrong thing yeah so await and that can probably fail too right yes I don't know if I need to do that close at the end or that or both it's probably safe to just do both right aside from look at this you thought big applause for Rust Analyzer? Yeah, Rust Analyzer is an awesome extension. That's what I've been using. This extension 
if you're interested in what I'm using. The other one out there is Rust. This one. It seems to have far more downloads than Rust Analyzer. Right? 10,000 versus 700,000. But um, I prefer this Rust Analyzer better. It does a few things that I really like. And uh, I think one of them was that um, it shows you the compiler errors and warnings in place. I don't know if the Rust plugin does that. The other thing I really like is that you have these run debug buttons. I'm pretty sure the Rust plugin doesn't do that. Only the Rust Analyzer one does. Okay. I can't remember if we're supposed to do one or the other of these two, so I'm going to do both. Should we just try it out? Apparently I don't need to mute take that one anymore because we are splitting it. I could combine these two. I could say that await split. I still need to separate that though from that line because we do need to jail the sync in order to get interior mutability for this loop. Stream doesn't need anything special though. I think we're good. So the only real error that we could return is if we couldn't get the t is if we couldn't connect. And I think that's what they did too, right? Well, if they don't connect, yeah, they do an uh, earlier turn. Oh wait, no, they okay, if we get an error on the um on this, but the way I have it set up, we don't get an error from the stream. Actually, the error would come back as a sync error, I think. Yes. Because these... No, that's not true. What, how, how do we know if the WebSocket errored out? I guess we would just get a, a different kind of close, right? I think that's the way my API is different. Rust extension is older than Rust Analyzer 2, is that why? The differences between users just coming into Rust and not aware? So it's like you have to be in the know to get Rust Analyzer. <laughs> Alright. Okay, so I need to figure out what to put there. I'm going to steal from them. I wish that the Autobahn guys were to have documented this, so I had to like reverse engineer looking at Tungsten, but the fact that we need to have that in here. So that's obviously a format, right? With two things in it. One's the case number and the other one's our agent identifier. Uh, what if I just hard code that for now and I, s well, no, we don't want to hard code it. I want to put it in one place. So let's include our agent here. String. Well, it doesn't actually need to be a string. It could be a slice. How about as ref? Where t is as ref slice. And we say as ref there. Uh, what's that? Hey there, user. I don't know what that you're asking about, but uh, let me know. I can tell you what I, I can wave to you first. I can say what we're doing today. Uh, what is a slice? A slice is a view into a string. So you are allowed to inspect the individual characters. So a uh, literal string is a slice. If I hover over this, it'll say, um, why is it saying arguments? Oh, because we're inside of the form. If I hover over this one, maybe, no. If I say let x equal hello. It's going to tell me hello is a reference to an str, so that's a string slice. That's different from if I were to make a string. That is a capital string, right? So a capital string is a value which holds on to uh, a pointer to where the characters in the string are, and then how many bytes it has allocated for that array of characters. And then the the type itself is able to like grow or shrink that string, right? 
Whereas a, a reference to a slice, there's two things there. There's the slice aspect, where it's just a pointer to some string of characters and a length. But you have no way of knowing, like, um, whether it's on the stack, the heap, the data segment, whether it's writable or not, you don't know. You just know that um, it is a pointer and a length, and that's it. You can't reallocate it. You can't grow or shrink it. Um, the reference part of it means that this we're borrowing that slice, so we're not allowed to, to change it. So... Um, this is roughly equivalent in, to C of a uh, con or C plus plus of a const care star const. If I made this mutable, then the reference itself could be changed, and we drop that const, right? So anyway, um, you can just think of it as a as the equivalent of that, where the equivalent of that in uh, C plus plus would be a standard string. You know, you might be familiar with that. It's the type that where you can um, grow or, or shrink the string, you can change it, whereas this, you're not allowed to change it. Um, the really cool thing about slices in Rust is that you can slice a slice. So I can say let x, uh, let x equal the slice of x from 1 to 2. And now um, this x is the, it'll be these characters E, L, uh, actually it'll just be the character E, right? Unless we made it, made it an inclusive range and then it's E, L. So it's sub-slicing. It's kind of like substring for constant character pointers. Um, so actually, going back a little bit, I wasn't precisely correct, right? To be precisely correct, if I say that, it's the equivalent of that plus, well, along with, I don't, what no notation do I want to say? Along with a um, size t length. So you get both a pointer and a length for, for a slice, whereas in C, C++, you would have to have two variables, a, a pointer and along with that a length, unless you follow the convention that the character is, um, the string is null terminated. Then you can drop the size, right? In Rust, you don't have null terminated strings. The slice intrinsically includes its length, and the string tracks its length, too. So there is no null at the end. String is analogous to standard string. That's correct. You understand that? Okay, that clears it up. Yeah. So I I have a habit of over explaining. <laughs> My apologies. Okay. So I need agent. Here's another wrinkle I'm throwing it into here. This is basically saying this function is generic over any type t where t can be turned into a reference to a slice of 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 a characters a string slice. So. This, you can call run test with a capital string, you can call it with a string slice, or you can call it with any type as long as that type implements this trait. Um, this is a short w way of saying in English, some, uh, some type which can be referenced, you can get a string slice by, by uh, getting a reference to that T. So um, when I call it down here, I should be able to say... Um, Uh, what are we going to say? Rymu's uh, Rymu WebSocket. <laughs> and I, it'll also work if I say string from that. That also works because they're both, they can both be referenced as a slice. But this is more efficient because we can use a literal and so this um, agent actually never needs to allocate memory in the heap. It um, continues to work even though it's a, it's a literal string in the data segment. And through um, the magic of Rust, we can even call functions on it. All right, so um, if I got the case number correct, this should actually work, right? I'm scared, though. I'm scared of running it. Running it now. Anyway, even though I'm scared. Well, we're running test cases. I don't know if we're... Passing or failing, should I pull up the console for the Autobahn? It actually doesn't tell me if I'm passing or failing either, does it? The uh, agent got through. Doesn't it seem kind of slow? I'm wondering if, like, I have some kind of timeout in there. Maybe they're all failing. I bet you they're all failing. <laughs> Because that's what I saw with the case count. It would fail because it would wait a second for me to do something, and then it would drop it. So we're probably failing all these test cases. Yeah, we're running in debug mode. I don't think that should matter, though. 
I think what we're, what's happening is we're failing all these tests. Pretty sure. Oh, I can see what's happening on the on the wire. Well, it is sending data. Look at that. You get quite a lot of data for some of these test cases. So these this is raw WebSocket stuff. Can I tell Wireshark to interpret this as WebSocket? There is a way to do this, right? You would say decode as, and then you'd pick a protocol here somewhere. Ah. Uh, WebSocket? I don't see it. I don't, I don't remember how to do this. There's a way you could tell it that, hey, interpret this traffic as WebSocket. I thought it was decode as, but this looks different. These are protocols, right? But I didn't see WebSocket in the list. If I type web, nope, that's not going to work. Yeah, there's no WebSocket. Ah, disappointed. So much disappoint. Um, I'm thinking of just calling it here because, well, no, it's uh, run to completion. I bet they're all going to be fails. Oh, and I'm missing one thing, right? They also did something at the very end. They ran some kind of update reports. Yeah, they ran a request to update the reports. We need to do that, actually. How about we run just like the first test case and not all of them? So I control C out of that. Status control C exit. Interesting. Didn't know I'd get an error for that. Okay, so um, let's hack this. And simply say, let cases be one. So at the end, I need to do an update reports, right? So, um, Update reports. Um, let's abstract out the agent to be one level up. This is then agent. This is T, agent T, where T is as ref slice, and then this would be agent. Oh, wait question mark right so then um, update reports same business here similar to case count right what do they do with that so just go to update reports agent equals okay so I will need to format here because this has to say agent. Uh, to uh, as ref. And um, oh, we needed a client in there. Oops. Need that. And uh, so they need, need a client down here. All right, and then what did I get wrong here? Oh, right, we're not actually reading any messages, right? We just connect, and then we close right away. So that would be um, WS close. 1000, K okay, thanks, bye. This can error out, right? Yeah, let that equal that await. Don't care. It's okay if we get to this point. Uh, this should be string from... Nope, that wasn't it. 
Uh, what did I get wrong here with this close? That should have worked. Oh, it's not a future. It's just that. That internally does executor block on. All right, that was a convenience function. Yep, okay. Rust has generics. It does. Rust has generics on types. They don't have generic traits yet, but I think they're working on that. Or it might be there, but it's not stable yet. You can do generics as long as um, the um, the argument here ends up being a concrete type, and you spe you you specify or you you narrow the um, the constraints of what the type can be through um, traits. So as ref is a certain kind of trait, it means that the only types that'll work here are types which implement this trait. Uh, there are other kinds of constraints here: lifetime constraints. There are um, uh, what is it? Marker traits, which are things you can't implement, but the compiler adds. Like you can say where T is uh, unpin or something, or uh, what am I thinking of? Send means you can send it from one thread to another. So it's um, it can be moved to a different thread. And sync means that you it's thread safe. All 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 of, a lot of a lot of uh, constraints you can set up to make um, to make your generics more narrow. Okay, let's run this. No, I have an error. What's wrong with this? Oh, we moved it. So we can't just borrow it. I guess we'll just get it then. Let agent agent as ref. That turns it into a slice if it wasn't one, and then we provide it to both of these guys. All right, so we're running it again. Oh, I did a I did a boo boo. We are already we're async. This can't be called async because these executors. So I need to do this the more the more elaborate way. Code is 100. Reason is k thanks by into. And this is web sockets. There we go. We should probably print something, right? Print line um, updating reports. Okay, so we probably failed that case. I'm not um, optimistic. We'll find out. So I looked at them through, not that ter terminal, but the other one, right? This one. So um, this one. All right. So we have Rhyme Web Sock in that list. Oh, it did pass. Huh. So we did, we did, oh, no, we failed one. Okay, so I have a test case to look at. And then there's a non-strict, I'm not sure what that means. Send a small message, then send again with RSV equal to, then send ping. Echo for first message you see, but then connections fail to me since RSV must be zero. The pong is not received. Oh, okay, so um, we didn't echo it back, probably because we closed it early, so it's a non-strict, okay. That's pretty detailed, look at that. You even have a wire log. So there's the correct text, and here's one with the reserve flag set, and then the close. Why did it fail after one second? Isn't 
Interesting. That's why the test cases are taking a long time, because we're not... It, they must be waiting for the connection to be dropped, and we're not dropping the connection. But we did send back... What is this? That's a close. So we sent back a close. Why did they send a close? Oh, I see what happened. I think this is totally messed up then. No, there is a there is a content in there. I just can't see it because it's masked. Why do they not unmask it so I can see what it is? I th think we're responding to this one, but why didn't we echo this one back? I don't know. Huh. Anyway, interesting we got these detailed reports. Let me see that failure. Actually, let me see the pass. That's the one I cared about, right? Case one. Send text with payload zero. Receive echo text message. Yeah, but this is failed connection after one second problem. Why this failed connection after one second? What about when Autobahn ran it? Oh, they also have failed connection after one second. Interesting. Thank you for the follow, by the way. So, empty text echoed back. And then... And then sending a close, receiving a close, dropped. Okay, so what did my code do? Same thing. Okay, so we did pass. Okay, should I just run them all? I don't know why the tests are taking so long to run, though. They shouldn't... They shouldn't be timing, they shouldn't be, um, so slow. I think it's just not, I think the closed handshake is not right. Like, it's timing out. Both sides are waiting until Autobahn gives up waiting. I guess I could probably see this in the Wireshark if I re re reset it. Okay, so hit stop. So, where's one that starts? Okay, here it is. Sin. All right. So, um, so is there a trailer in there? There is a trailer. So that, that's a, probably a ping, right? And then we send back a. Actually, it did interpret it as a WebSocket. Look at that, WebSocket. It is a pong with a bunch of FEs in it. Weird. So this is not a clean... There's no... Fi there's... Wait, what? Is it my code that's waiting an extra second? It must be my code that's waiting an extra second, so we don't see anything happen between... Well, this reset's kind of weird, though. Because we see a fin... Oh, no, this is them resetting the connection on us. So we... We send... No, they sent... They closed on us. No, we closed on them. We closed on them, and then they reset the connection. Why, don't, why not just cleanly disconnect? Hmm. Did this one have a fin in it? No, push an ack. Huh. Let me look at the next one. A whole bunch of pushes. It must have been a longer test. Back and forth. 
That must have been a fragmented test. So again, we sent that one. We, we sent them a close and then we closed our connection. Oh, wait, did they? Oh, hold on. Which direction is this? This is us sending a close. Why would we send a close there? Wouldn't they send us a close first? Unless this is an error. Well, I, we might be closing on them because of an error. Can I see the, the reason? Normal closure. Okay. So it's not an error. Why did we close there then? Oh, did they send a ping and then immediately a close? They might have. It's kind of hard to see. Uh, it's hard to see all this stuff. Okay, here they sent the close and then we reply with a close. And then they... No, we, we reply with a close and then we sent a fin bef Oh, did we prematurely close the connection before they, they act it? Hmm, I wonder if that's a problem. We sent our close, but then they haven't acted yet. And then we send the, f the fin flag. No, no, the, they're still resetting us. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay, so it's not a problem. All right, continuing on. Still moving, huh? Uh-oh, are we stuck? This one's stuck? I can look at the wire and see if it's still going. I think it might be stuck. So we're stuck on test case 221. Hmm, how am I going to debug that? Oh wait, uh no, I stopped the I stopped the trace. Shoot, so it might still be running. Oh and I don't okay, I don't know. <laughs> well, okay. Never mind. I'll just keep that running. I'll hit control C and I'll run it again. While it's running, let me try to think about why um we might be sitting there for an extra second. Looking at the wire protocol, right? So, um... There's a one second gap between this socket being closed and this one being opened by us. So either I have a hard-coded one second in there, or something else is going on. Where would I have a timeout of one second? I don't think I have any timeouts. Make that smaller. This is going to exhaust the stream. It's going to wait forever. So there's no timeout. Oh, you know what it might be? It might be uh, my, my Windows machine taking a second to establish a connection to the Linux box. That might... That's possible, actually. Because I've, I've seen that happen where... Um, yeah. Where it... Um, the DNS resolver for that... Lo so if I maybe replace it with a um, an IP address here... I should, I should actually extract that out as another variable, right? I'm waiting for it to get to, what was it, 221? And I can see um, what it is doing in the traffic. 
I mean, it's still going. Each one is ending with a with a disconnection. It's just my computer, my Windows computer, taking a second before it establishes the next one. Hmm. All right. Anyway, that's a that's a that's a puzzle. I want to include the um, base URL, don't I? Yeah. In um, this. Let's keep it at that. So this would be... Um, What if I just have the host part? That makes more sense, right? Well, no, it should include the scheme too. Because I might decide later to turn it into um, use TLS. Okay. Yes. So then um, this is um, base URL or URI. Base URL. T. Hey there, oh my shell. How are you doing? We're running some uh, tests for my web server WebSocket code against the um, Autobahn test suite. And here's the raw traffic. If you're curious, so each one of these test cases is doing an HTTP GET and getting a response and then elevating to the WebSocket protocol, which we see occasionally, like in the form of this. Like that's a closed message sent across the wire. Are there any, any more interesting ones besides clothes? Like, are there text messages in there? Lovely test cases. Okay, there's a text one. Line-based text data. Gibberish. <laughs> they don't use interesting strings in their test cases? Well, th maybe because these are masked. Okay, can we see it in the other direction? Yeah, these aren't very interesting. Here's some longer ones. But these are it's, it's all gibberish. What kind of message is that? Wow, single byte. Oh, this test must have been sending one byte at a time. Wow. One byte at a time sending a message. All right. Anyway, how far are we? Did we get on the test case that's stuck? Okay, so I wanted to look at this. What happens on the last test case before we get stuck? Oh, there is a, almost a second delay here, and they reset our connection. Interesting. So... We act and then they re so we basically got stuck on whatever this message is. Wait, what? It's an incomplete HTTP request. Interesting. So this one's not even a complete handshake. Oh, no, it is. Wait a second. Oh, this is just one segment, right? Okay, I'm having trouble reading this. There is the entire... Oh, okay, there it is. What is it, though? What is that message? 0A88... No, it starts here, right? Um, 8870... What is that? That's a close, right? Oh, this is a close with an illegal length. Yeah, that's not legal, I think. Then why is our code getting stuck on that? Oh, wait, wait. I know why. Because we're not declaring it illegal. We're saying that that is a legal... What? That just got eaten and not handled? Okay, so I think I know what to look for that. Any advice on project structures so that when projects become large, they're still organized? 
yeah, break them up into as small pieces as you can. That's my advice, is don't wait to uh, break things up into smaller pieces. When things are into smaller pieces, it's a lot easier to arrange them to fit what you want. And then you'll identify pieces that you never actually use much. If you ever have trouble breaking something up into pieces, then that's a sign that you have um, your... It's too tightly bundled with its dependencies. On what basis and how small? Uh, it, how, how much you're comfortable with it. Um, the rule of thumb I've found that other people use um, is keeping every source file within like 500 lines. And the things which in the source, the, everything within one source, source file should have a common concern. So like one function or one type or one um, component. And um, if you do that and your single component is more than 500 lines, then it's a sign that you should break that, maybe break that component up into smaller sub concerns. Like my WebSocket ended up being broken up because quite a lot of it was just the builder code. So, um, and it's unit tests. So 200 lines of code just to do the builders. And then um, also... Um, after I extracted the builders, I found that um, it was still too large, and so what I ended up doing is, is extracting the receivers and the, re the sender stuff, which is doing the raw framing. And then I got it to where, like, the receivers is 243 lines, sender is 146 lines, and then overall, not counting the tests, it, I think it's, yeah, it's a little bit large, so it's around 700 lines. So that makes me think that I should look for another something separable like something in here that i should in, in that i should look for something in here that like maybe could be split out just looking at this for examples like select like the worker thread and its tasks could be separated from the main type because the only point between them is um well, there's two points. There's when we drop, we have to um, we have to join the worker thread, and um, the other point is where when we create the uh, where do we create it? Thank you for the follow. Yeah, where we create it, we make the worker thread here. So I can make if I moved worker to another module and just pulled everything it ne depends on with it, I could probably split this into two this one 700 line file into two files probably 200 500 split or something like that so yeah it, it takes it takes experience and just just um a, a feeling that like when the file especially if after you've written some code you come back to it a week later and you say oh well this is it's hard for me to find things in it then that's a sign like those are signs that you need to start trying to split things up if you're comfortable with like a 2000 line program and you don't work with anyone else on it, so you're not going to be sharing the, the, the code, um, it's perfectly fine to keep it comfortable. Keep, if it's comfortable for you, then it's the size is right <laughs> at all. And in the, in, the, in the end, it comes down to what striking a balance between, um, comfort and, um, well, that's it. It comes down to striking to, to, Striking a balance between the comfort of everyone involved. So if you're a solo dev and you're comfortable with your own code, then you don't need to worry about organization. But if you find that even being a solo dev, you're still uncomfortable, like you can't, like you just get irritated with yourself about how it's hard to organize stuff, then it's a sign that you need to, um, in my opinion, split things up into smaller pieces. Because each piece on its own should be something that you can just focus your thought on. Like for my builders here. The builders are just creating WebSocket, not not handling it when it's once it's open, just just opening it, just the open call, right? That's its only concern. And if I can fit that into uh, not counting the test, fit that down to 200 lines. Now, if I ever have a problem with opening a WebSocket, I'll probably start looking here to see if maybe something is wrong in the start or the finish, and I and, and I don't have to be distracted by details not relevant to opening, right? So. In my experience, it's just easier that way. If you can split things by concern, and and if a concern gets too big, think about, well, maybe one concern like opening a socket could be split between the start and the finish, right? So I could further divide this into two, 
into two pieces, maybe two separate files, one that does the start part and the other one that does the finish part. If if you go too far, you'll find yourself like getting annoyed that you're jumping across files all the time. So if you if you're like, man, I seem to have to have three or four different files open because I'm constantly shuffling between them, that's a sign that you maybe went too far or that you didn't divide it correctly. Like you kind of want to divide it so that you can focus on one thing at a time and not have to be have three things open. You know, a concern being like some aspect of your code. If you can fit that into one file and you're comfortable with the size, then that's that's what that's the good zone to be in. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, what do I want to address first? Maybe this issue, we try to recreate this. Find out what happened with that test. Or do I want to look at this test that failed here? I kind of want to get results for all of the tests. So I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to um, address this test first because it's gumming up the works. It's making every, either that or address the one second timeout problem. I think I'm going to address the one second timeout problem because that is making it really slow to get to all the tests. For Yeah, so we're going to do the why does it take one second for each test? Because it shouldn't. It should be a lot faster. And then I'll figure out what's gumming up the works for this test. And then when I get all the tests to run, then we're going to look at all the ones that fail. I think I want to do a check-in of my code first, though, because I haven't done that all day long. Where's my terminal? I don't even have a terminal open. <laughs> That's how confident I am, I guess. Okay, so web sockets get cola. Okay, so there are multiple chain. Let's just pull everything in and we'll just write the extended description first. So pull in Rimu web published version. Add Raimu your Remarai and Raimu web client dependencies needed by example. All right, and so this one is uh, introduce auto bon client example work in progress. What do I do with the builder? All oh, right, so fix bug in not making the trailer bytes received by a uh, by the server no by the client after the end of a successful protocol upgrade available uh, to the upgraded protocol handler and sort of paired with that is fixed bug and not feeding trailer bytes into WebSocket uh, before uh, what waiting for more data to arrive. All right, that was the problem. And the, the builder need to have all these vectors, right? Because okay, that's just pulling in dependencies, right? Yeah. Or oh, actually, that's making things public. So I need to list that. Um, make. Um, Last fragment, sync message, and stream message public. All right. Here's where the trailer filter makes its way down. Here's the key to not reading before handling the trailer. Otherwise, it's just passing that data down, right? And then including in all the tests, yes. Okay. So actually, this one is a is in the other crate so I, so i'm gonna list it there actually um i'm just gonna put it in my clipboard because i'm about to make the git commit for the other crate anyway so commit summary what's the summary for this uh work in progress adding example which um tests client with auto Bon fuzz server. We're a little bit over the edge, but that's okay. We'll deal with that. Okay, the other one was HTTP client. No, server. Hmm. 
No. Where was it then? Was it HTTP client? It was client, yeah. Sorry. Client. This problem here. Fix bug and not making the trailer or see by the client at the end of, of a successful protocol upgrade available to... So, that's just the one thing we did, right? So this is... um. Fix bug in trailer bytes not being handled. All right. Oh, we also actually there were two things we did here. Um, should I make them in different commits then? The other thing is I removed all those print statements. Oh, and that thing too. That's a third thing. So hold on. What if I start by? St Staging that one and then unstage the print lines. Just unstage all that. Oh, someone's home. That's why the dog's barking. Uh, I'm just removing print statements right now. So these ones. This line. I think I got them all, right? So, minus all the print lines, this is the change to do this bug. Just checking. I did have to add that. Uh, I'll include that in there. Because I think adding these, this code put me over the complexity edge for... So there's... Ask, you're asking also um, how to help organize. If you do it in Rust, sometimes... the uh, um, the linter helps you with that. It'll say that your function has too many lines of code, and that's another suggestion that you need to organize the function better by making it smaller. The only way to make code smaller is to either delete the code or to divide the code into separate pieces. Uh, yeah, so we're including the trailer now. Yes, everywhere. Okay, I like this commit. So commit that, and then this one is... Paired with this actually is removing the print statements. We don't need that error variant anymore. Okay, so then this all goes together, right? So um, remove debug print statements. And remove unable to get peer address is a variant of error since we don't need it anymore. Because we also rem remove the lookup of the peer address part of debugging. Remove that. Okay, so remove debugging code. Because I don't think we need it at the client level anymore. I think all our bugs are at the WebSocket level. Did I make GitCola? No. Endorn, one of my mods, told me about it. It's pretty neat. I used to use um, Git GUI all the time, but it doesn't have a dark mode. And git cola does, so I think we could just find it, right? Git cola. The highly caffeinated git GUI. There you go. I don't know who made it, actually. It has all the features that I like to have for, that I had in git GUI, but it has the um, ability to do it in, uh, to, to theme it in a dark mode, which is the one thing git GUI never did for me. All right, is this still stuck, or did I, con I did control C out of it? How did I end up looking at the diff? I don't know. I want to make sure I've checked in all my stuff. Uh, I might have differences at the workspace level. Oh, I have a work. I have a server. Oh, this. Yeah, this one's important, right? Get cola. Yes. So we are changing. So um, use published version of Rimu Web. Pretty sure that at the uh, root, it's going to be all about, all about my workspace dependency hier dependency tree in the cargo lock. Yes. So I'm just going to say update Rust dependencies. I'm still on the fence about whether we should check in cargo lock. I think that I should because if I want to recreate a bug that requires me to know what version of everything we had, the Cargo lock is the only artifact that re that tracks the actual version numbers, like down to the to the to the um, commit hashes if they're not published versions. 
So I'm inclined to keep it even though it's a burden on me because it, now it's splitting a concern that there are now two Git repositories minimum that I need to constantly check into. All right. Um, why are the tests taking a, a second? Right, I was in the middle of making this change. I want. I think I'm going to add print statements to figure out where, like, where the code is at the end. Like, where is this? Ec wh why is it taking another second to make another connection? Right. Like, where? What are? What's? What's our code doing? So base URL. Um, that's going to make its way down to run to d both of these actually. Client base URL. Client base URL. Report. All right, and so um, that's here. Base URL is a T. So that goes here, right? Base U. Why did it do base 64? That was weird. Okay. Another base URL up here to go here. Base URL as ref. Okay, and then there's one more, right? Here. So I need to make it generic. Because we're doing this where T can be referenced as a string slice. Uh, so we need to format here. Base URL as reference. What extensions do I have on? Why don't you use the Git integration? Uh, mainly don't use the Git integration because it doesn't have the ab ab easy ability for me to do staging of individual lines. Um, no, no, that wasn't it. It has that, but w the one thing it doesn't have is it... Currently, there's a problem with VS Code in that if I have a... Um, directory structure with git repositories inside of other git repositories and they're not sub modules it does git lens doesn't even see it like if i go to the vs where's the vs tab i hardly ever use this i don't know which one it is it's this one right it's going to say that i have no changes to webs to this file even though i definitely have changes to this file right it only th it only sees changes to the root repository did i never check that in huh Oh, this is a different repository. Oh, this is the one we, we care about. Yeah, see, it says there are no changes in Excalibur, right? Because it doesn't um, it doesn't see the sub the sub repositories. I don't use Git sub modules. Instead, what I use actually talks about it here with Mugget. Um, I wrote a tool to manage having Git repositories that um, pull in other s uh, smaller Git repositories, and it's kind of like what they do in Android. So I have an XML file. Why is XML format? It's because the tool is designed years and years and years ago, and uh, before I even really got familiar with JSON. So it's an older format, but anyway, it specifies what branch we want every subrepository on, and this is the key: Git submodules don't let you pick a branch. At least they don't let you pick a branch that's moving. With Git submodules, you can pick a commit. And which means you can pick a, lay, a a branch as a commit, but it will pin it to that commit until you um, decide to update the submodule, and then that results in a change to the root repository. Which means I would constantly having to make commits for my root repository, which I don't, which I'm not a fan of. So instead, I split it, and I have to um, have a tool which manages, um, you know, defining the hierarchy and saying, well, what what are the repositories in my workspace, and what branches they pull from. And um, the, another consequence of that is I need to have a git ignore. Otherwise, git constantly thinks that I forgot to check in those as submodules. And I believe it's having them all listed in git ignore is, is what's causing them not to show up in the source control changes. So, yeah, one thing led to another. The end result is I can't really use the source control tab because it never shows me anything. <laughs> because of my own, basically my own choices. So, um... So I just use the command line and um, for a lot of Git stuff, and um, I do I do rely on the um, a, a GUI for what I was started to say in the beginning. Like when I want to stage individual lines like that, I will use a Git GUI because it's just much more convenient to highlight with the mouse and hit S than it would be to use a Git Add Interactive, 
which I have seen people use. I don't want to knock that. It's just not my favorite thing. All right. Sorry about the long explanation. I need to... Um, what was I doing here? I need to fix the compiler errors resulting from adding this base URL to various things, right? This actually should have been fine. Uh, what's wrong here? I know this should give me a problem with... Actually, uh, now that this isn't... Uh, we don't have to do this anymore, right? No, we still have to do that, but I don't. I can do this now. What's wrong with this agent one? On reference, why is it expecting a parameter t? Okay, I don't get this. This is also wrong. Oh, I didn't get that one yet. Ah, shoot. No, I did get that. What the heck? Oh, right, because I didn't do this. Let base URL... We need to convert to a slice first. Now it's happy. Got it. Yes, thank you, Sarian. I was like... We're, we're, we got it, I think I've got it about the same time. It's just that the stream lag made it so I got it before I saw your message. <laughs> After using it, a lot for research, they give way less problems than YML. XML is just old school, you know? It's got a lot of extra envelope stuff that you don't always need. Like my uh, repository manifest it's really um, a lot of overhead. It would be a lot smaller file if it, was if it was just JSON. Okay, so... This is running again, I hope. Only it's going to be still be slow. So I refactored that on purpose because I wanted to make the agent name and the base URL separate. So, n let me check that in. So this is... Uh, Extract fuzz server base URI to be in one place. Stage commit push. Probably don't need to be running get, uh, garbage collect manually anymore. I I did I got in the habit of doing that because Git GUI would had this annoying problem if you collected too much garbage in your Git repo locally. So I would just tell it to collect it all the time. All right, so then um, let's do some pr extra print statements. What I suspect is that it's on our end taking up to a second to resolve the uh, c the um, connection. So I'm going to put a print before we start connecting. Or do we already have one? We already have one. I just need to have a, a print after we get the... Um, Right, after we after we get connected, so we'll say connecting, connected, and I just run this again. Yeah, so there's a second delay in us connecting. All right, so so it's not in during the test run at all. It's during the the connection process. So, um, I okay, that's right. Now I remember why I extracted this because I wanted to try a IP address and not a host name because I'm thinking the host there's something wrong on my local network in the host name resolution. So what if I just get that address manually? Uh, I could actually see it from here, can't I? One nine two one six eight zero two two one. Maybe that second delay will go away. There we go. That was it. <laughs> so it has to do with local name resolution. There's something wrong on my network. Is Rust comparable to C, C++? I think so. There are certain things that each language is easier to use for, I guess is the right way to say it. I think, for example, it's easier to use C, C++ when you um, want to 
do what's known in Rust community as unsafe code. So um, when you um, want to manipulate pointers, on the whole, I would say that they um, they are comparable somewhat, but Rust has things which C C plus plus don't yet have, unless they've added it to C plus plus twenty. So there's it's possible because I haven't updated I haven't um, read about what they've added in C plus plus twenty, but I've heard that certain things were added to C plus plus twenty, which which sound familiar like what things have Rust is introducing, but I don't I don't know for for sure. Um, C I would say C is is old. Rust is a lot newer than C. So C is going to be missing a lot of the innovation they've added to the tool set uh, because just C is older. They didn't have it. There's been a lot of uh, advancement in programming languages over the years, and programming languages will um, borrow from each other, or steal, however you want to say it, um, innov innovative ideas. And languages like C, just they're, because they're so old and so... Um, widely used it's really hard to add something to the, a language like that where it's a lot easier to add it to rust especially because rust has built into it the concept of having channels of progress in updating the compiler and the language so there's like the stable or there's the nightly version of the tool chain and they can have more freedom to change things in the nightly build but still get the widespread testing because it's available to everybody globally Whereas with C, C++, it's harder to do that because there's nothing built into the community or the language or, you know, however you want to say it, to um, try out new ideas and get widespread testing of it, right? You have, to, you have to go through a lot of hoops to get a special nightly build of the C++ compiler, for example. Whereas with Rust, you just add, literally, you just add those, the string plus nightly and you, you got it. So if I... Open a term. Uh, let's close that. If I open a terminal, if I do cargo clippy, for example, and then I'm like, let's 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 say I've heard about some new lint rule that's added in the nightly build. I can just say cargo dot nightly clippy, and it'll take a little bit longer because it's now using a different tool set, so it's having to check the code again with the with the nightly build versus the um, the uh, stable build. And you can see actually there are some warnings that are not in stable Rust yet. <laughs> Yeah, so these these warnings I'm not getting um, with um, stable Clippy because they are still being developed. It's just super easy to do certain things in Rust compared to, to C++ because they are just innovations that people just didn't have when they designed Rust. I mean, uh, C. I don't have an Autobahn link, but we can make one. Add command... Why, don't, why am I typing it? I can type it here. Add com auto bond. Where do you want to say? Just the link to it? Why don't we just have a, a link to it? There. Now if you try again, you'll get a link to the auto bond test suite. I can't claim to have written auto bond. It's written by fine folks behind the auto bond suite. <laughs> Okay, so um, so now I know that this, the tests were taking a long time because the IP address resolution is bad. So let's just keep that for now. The next problem was to address why do we get stuck on test case 221, right? I suspect that we actually have a bug that causes it to never disconnect. It's interesting that the server... Does the server disconnect? Let's look at the bottom. 221. Okay, so the server disconnects us after a delay. Looks like it's roughly a, a, like a little bit less than a second, judging by the, the difference in the time between those two packets. You can see the difference is about a second. So they're disconnecting us, but my code is not detecting that for some reason. So I think what I want to do is look at the exact message that they include and try to reproduce this in my own test suite. Yeah, so this sequence, 88, 70, 0, 0, 70, and then there's the um, status code and then filler, right? So this is a special extended length, which we didn't need to do to try to get around the, um, the problem. Actually, let me also look at, thank you for the follow, by the way. Let's look at the text for 221. Actually, I don't even know which one 221 is. How do we know which one's which here? 
I don't know which one's which. Would it be the one we didn't get to? Okay, no, we're skipping 9, 12, and 13. Okay, then which one didn't we not get to? Wait. Are there other ones missing? Oh, I'm looking at the wrong column. Okay, so it's this one, right? K627. It says missing. Actually, we don't know which one's which. I'm guessing that's it. So we're getting stuck on um, either that one or the one before it. Uh, let's look at this one first. No, this is text payload. This is not the close one, so... I don't know which one's which. <laughs> I don't know which test case is two, 221. Um, how am I going to... Oh, I know what I'll, this will tell me, right? Ah, 736 is where we're getting stuck. 736, okay. Okay, so we just didn't update the um, results. Right, that's right. We have to actually run the update results to get this to update. So it's this test case we're getting stuck on. Send a closed frame with closed code and closed reason, which is too long. Total pay frame payload, 126 octets. I thought I had a test for that. You set your max case to 220 and run it up to that? Yeah, I guess that's a fair point. Um, just hack this then. Yeah, let's run it. Oh, I don't want to run Clippy. Run. This should run fairly quickly now. So some of those tests do take a little bit longer because they're like long messages that are fragmented, right? Even the the Python Autobahn was taking a long time to run those ones. Okay, we got updated reports. Yay. Let's reload. Yep. So it got down to 736, and we passed it. We just didn't ever move on to the next one. Oh, looks like I have another failure there. So I have one, two failures for sure. I have two failures, and then we have a few that are non-strict pass that we should look at too. Okay. All right. So then um, I want to recreate this test case, actually. Uh, I just need to take a quick break. I need to drink some more water. It's been four hours. That might be why I'm getting tired. No, I think it is that one because um, looking at the wire, um, th we're doing the correct thing as we're supposed to um, to close. So we are closing here. Or are they closing? Yeah, we're closing the connection here. And it's kind of hard to see. Oh, no, it says a normal closure. We shouldn't have got... Oh, no, that, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. That's the update reports. Oh, I'd have to go back and look for it. Judging by the case numbers now. He's somewhere near the middle, right? Around here. Okay, close. Okay, here it is. Right, so, um, actually, I don't know why they marked it as a passing test, because we're supposed to close on them. I guess by us not replying and just them having to disconnect, it counted as a, as a pass? Or you could be right, we could be looking at the wrong one. But this one said the last one was 735, right? And this says 735 and 736 are both passing. Okay, that's weird. How could we be passing 736? It does say none. That's weird. Did I not run them all? Do you think that a CS degree helps in becoming a better developer? 
Yes, but indirectly. I think pursuing a higher... What are we going to call it? Higher education helps you in that it prepares you with the tools you need to learn. I think you won't learn the developer skills themselves, but you'll learn how to learn. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I didn't go to college and get a CS degree, I could probably have still um, been a developer, but it would have taken me longer because I wouldn't be as efficient in learning. So learning in school, they teach you how to approach a problem, how to do critical thinking, how to take notes if, you, if notes is something that helps you. And um, that is what you learn in school. But I don't think I would ever really care to take a class that teaches a specific technology, like uh, a class on Rust or something like that, because I could just learn it by myself. I think the most valuable things to learn in, in school are um, the critical thinking skills. So that's actually one reason why I'm not really that much in favor of going past a um, like a bachelor's degree. Like I never got a master's degree or a PhD or anything like that because what's the point? Like it's 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 uh, I think spending too much time in school and not using your um, knowledge for practical real world applications. I, I guess I guess that makes me a a, a non academic. <laughs> Okay, that is really weird that it doesn't say we're running 735, maybe, or 736, maybe we ran it successfully some other time? Because here it says we passed it, but it says there was no result, no, um, re no, uh, code. We're supposed to, that we returned the wrong code, or didn't return any code. Let's look at the specific case. Okay, the difference between this is one's 123, so it's not too long, and this one is definitely too long. So that's 7E, right? 124 is 7E. No, that's not right. 124 is the close reason, so we have to add 2 for the code. So that's 126 total, which is 7E. And that's what I'm seeing for this last one, right? Uh, for 221. Shoot, I need to keep my cursor on it, because I'm going to lose my place again. It's around here. This run. This one was giving us a length of 70. So that, so subtract 2. So, well, 70 is 126, right? So subtract 2, you've got 124, which is what they're saying. The length is for case 736. Oh, okay, now I know what happened. When I hacked it to say only run 220 of them, it didn't try to run 221. But when it did try to run 221 before, it was actually, um, from the server's point of view, passing even though we didn't give it, a, we never gave it a close. And that's why it says up here, pass but none for the code. All right, got it. <laughs> Started learning Rust during your first year at university? Okay, that's interesting. So, lock me and Matt's. I hope that they teach Rust at the university in terms of get, equipping you with the skills in, in, that you'll need to learn things on your own later. Because otherwise, they're just teaching you practical knowledge that's going to be outdated, right? Um, in five years, Rust won't look the same. So, hopefully... That's why I was saying the, the, the biggest thing you get out of a university is that you pick up the skills to learn on your own. And tips for beginners to get better at coding. Uh, pick a language that you um, enjoy learning. Pick small projects that are, that are fun. And if you need guidance, go. To, I would say look at something like... Uh, what is it? FreeCodeCamp.org even if it's not beginner friendly. FreeCodeCamp.org has like a, a course for like web dev stuff, but I think they also have links to other, other kinds of technologies as well. But I like to pass around that link and so you can at least look at that for an example of that. Um, if you want something specifically for Rust, it's not gonna be beginner friendly, 
but uh, you will get better at coding and programming if you get through it, and that's uh, that's easy because Rust has a really uh, friendly um, introduction. You just go to uh, learn Rust. Rust-lang.org slash learn, and they have like three different paths you can pick from. You can either read a book, you can look at examples, or you can do a, a guided course. And then if you're if you're th if you through that, then they have more learning material to to re read from, or you could join streams like this and just watch someone else code in it. Uh, that's another way to get better at coding. Watch other people coding. So you should be picking up for me not like the right way to do code, but how my way of code might be different from yours, and then how the problems I'm running into may be the same or different from yours, and then you can look at how I approach solving the problems and um, recognize the fact that I'm not going to be perfect or even right a lot of the time. I'm going to be completely wrong, and I'll get stuck on a problem for hours. But at least gives you a perspective of seeing how other people code, and that might teach you something about how you code or, or just give you other ideas on what you could try. Like, I might be approaching a problem a different way than you might do, and then might give you some ideas that you didn't have before. Hi, from South... Hi, back to South Korea. How are you today? Menu 297. Okay, um... I'm, I got a little sidetracked, but that's okay. What I need to address here is that... Uh, where'd the window go? This one... We're getting hung up on test case 736, which is we need a closed frame where the reason is exactly 124 characters. So I need to make a um, unit test for that. And furthermore, they constructed it in a sort of a strange way, didn't they? Oh, no, you have to construct it like this because if your length is 126 or larger, you have to go to two bytes. Yeah, okay, so I need, I'm not, let's make a unit test for it. Let me stop stalling and actually do it. So let's go to um, WebSocket and I'll add, a, I'll add a test case. Let's look for if do I have one that has 126. 124? Oh, here we go. Is this it? Don't this give me the exact... Oh, but this is sending it, not receiving it. So we need to have one that's a receive close too long. Yeah, okay. So all right, we're going to have something similar, only it's receive and not send. Spooky that the test we need is almost exactly like the test we have last, only it's in the opposite direction. Receive. It's almost like I planned it that way. Receive close, reason too long. Okay. So then receiving is processing the stream like this. Correct? I'll put that down in here. We're not sending it, we're receiving. Okay, so I need the back end of the connection there. And this needs to be um, put into a cell. So let it be ref cell new. And once again, what the ref cell does is it takes a value and allows you to borrow it mutably at runtime and the variable itself is not mutable. We don't have a mute in front there. So that we can use it with something which iterates, like fold, inside of an asynchronous uh, closure. Thank you for the follow. We don't need our WebSocket to be mutable anymore because fold actually, uh, the, the, this reader actually consumes the WebSocket. It doesn't need to change it. It just um, it owns it. Okay, so then... We should expect... What should we expect? I should expect a special kind of error, right? I think I had built into this... Uh, let me put a bookmark. I, I had in here on uh, receive frames that if we get something that's too long... We should get a frame too large. Frame payload too large, so we should get a we should get exactly that in the test. So we want that. So a thousand and nine frame too large should be the reason that we get. And um, 
how to detect that actually that's exactly what I should get. I should get a closed message back up to the user. And this will cause the um the stream to close and us to get back out. So then um I need to craft the actual message that is a frame too large for a close. I could actually cheat and look at what they did. <laughs> 8870. Let's just do that. Let's just totally cheat and reproduce the exact frame. Then 0, then 7E again, right? Then 3E8. And then a bunch of 2As. So I think what I'll do is I'll say, take that. And um, do I need to iter here? Copied chain with another sequence. And this sequence is going to be the byte... 2a repeated 124 times and then I th does that just work as is no it wants it probably wants me to give it a vector so i need to collect it into a vector and did i get the types right okay it i need to annotate the types apparently wait a minute i shouldn't need to Why does it need a type annotation for that? What are the types involved here? Uh, can it tell me what these types are? Uh, an iterator over bytes. Okay, I guess I didn't need to do that. And then chain with... Okay, chain doesn't work because of what reason? Okay, so this needs to be copied. Oh, repeat doesn't return an iterator, does it? It returns a vector. So I need to iter and actually, can I just do into iter? Uh, I can't, if I, I guess I can't. So I might as well just do iter copied. It's still wrong. Oh, two f <laughs> a reference to a reference is not right. Um, shoot. Copied should be a... Wait. This was all... I didn't need to do the copied? Huh. Because collect can collect into other types? Yeah, but it should be able to... Im oh, it can't imply it because it could be any type that goes into a vector. Okay, you're right. Thank you, Lock Mean Mats. Let me give you a point. All right, so I need to say what type we want. Um, something that can go into a vector... I'm I'm surprised that it couldn't just accept an iterator. Can uh convert from chain iter iter not satisfy. Okay, I guess chain doesn't imp can't go into a uh, vector. I guess we'll have to use collect after all. Just give it a vector. We have to say what kind of vector. A vector of figure it outs. Uh, no. Because I need to put that there. Turbo fish. Still not quite right. Okay, it's getting a bunch of references, so can I say I don't want references? It's probably going to say it can't because they're references. Yeah, that's why I was trying to use copy. Do I need to do copy to this point? There we go. And I probably don't need to say the type here anymore. Actually, can I get away with not saying the type at all? No, I have to say it, that it's a vector. Okay, good. <laughs> you see how I struggle with it? A lot of it is just not not used to the types that you get when you start iterating. So this is taking a byte string and calling iter, and I can never remember, do you iterate the bytes or you do, are you iterating the references to the bytes? So in, uh, hovering over it, actually another way to do it is just tell turn on inlay hints. So you can see that this is a borrowed a reference to an array of some length, right? And then this is an iterator over bytes. This is some implementation of an iterator where the item is, well, we, the inlay hint doesn't help. I have to over over it. So it's chain of two iterators together, right? And um, I suppose what I'm learning here is that when you collect what chain 
gives you, you get references. And you can't collect references to make a vector of bytes. So that's what copy does. Copy is turning a... Um, the chain is returning references, and copy turns those references into values so that we can collect them into a um, vector of bytes again. So without the copied again, um, this complains because we end up getting a vector of references to bytes. You can kind of... Okay, chat's in the way. <laughs> I need to show it here. Cargo Clippy uh, test. And then blow it up. So you can kind of see it here. It the the hint is that there's a uh, an and sign on that U8. So that's a hint telling us that um, we ended up with a vector of references to bytes instead of of a vector of bytes. And the culprit ends up being chain. That um, chain is returning a iterator of references. And so to turn that into not to dereference, you use copied. The alternative to use to do copied would be to do map from um, some byte to that byte, right? So that'll work too, although, although it's going to tell me that it's... I could have done map clone. Interesting. I didn't know that. Oh, cool. So I... Wait a minute. What is map clone? How do I use this map clone? How does one use a map clone? See, I learn all the time just from Clippy. You do a standard iter repeat take 124 for the input to the chain. Instead of doing a byte string 2a repeat 124. Yeah, I guess so. That's another way you could do it. So you, you said you're saying I wouldn't need a vector then? Right, because uh, I use repeat, which makes a vector. Okay, so let me give you a point because that's more efficient. So what is it about this map clone? Oh, dot cloned, okay. In my case, it, we know that it can be copied, so I can do copy instead of cloned. So I'm just saying I could have just done uh, cloned here. So that'll work too. Cloning, copy, same thing for uh, a byte. Okay, so... What Sarian is saying is, instead of forming a vector, which is what repeat does here, can I put this on multiple lines and have the inlay hint show me that? Yes, look at that. So, we start with a reference to bytes. That turns it into a vector, but we need to combine it with an iterator um, in the chain anyway, so there's no point in actually making a vector. So the better way is, like what Silma said, that you have a, um, what did you, standard iter repeat. The uh, byte... So here we can just say the byte, right? 2a. And then take it 124 times. Because otherwise, this would repeat forever. This says a stop after 124th element. Uh, what's the problem here? Does repeat give me uh, references again? Uh, I should just do this to see. What do I get? Oh, stop that. The formatter is getting in the way. <laughs> Does it end up giving me references so I have to do copied? No, that's not it. Okay, I should just look more closely at the error. Yeah, expect an integer found a reference to an integer. Do I not need that? No, I do need that uh, copied. Why is that? Okay, I can't do a copied for a take. Why? Mismatch. Wait, what? So you can't do copied for take? Oh, is it the other way around? You're saying that this iter, iter gives me references? No, this one's giving me bytes. Oh, no. It, it's an iter when you um, actually, to call next, you get references. Okay, so I was wrong all along about which side um, 
about where the in reference is introduced. So this introduces references to bytes. This collapse dereferences them all by making copies. And then we can chain it with this, which we never, we never had references because we never had a byte string to begin with. Okay, so the, the takeaway from this is when you start with a literal array and you iterate that, you're going to get references because Rust is not going to want to make a copy of the bytes just to iterate them. So we should just assume this, this gives us references. This makes copies of every byte in order to chain it and then collect it. Into, okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> Turn off inlay hints. Okay, so if it takes you a while, don't feel bad. It takes me a while too. Thank you for the follow. All right, so that took way too long. That's okay. We learn, right? Let's run the test. Hopefully reproduce the problem. The wrong error code is returned, but it did return an error code. I wonder if it's because it timed out. I do have a timeout in here. No, but if it timed out, then it means we never got to get a message out. Interesting. Anyway, the code is wrong. Uh, so I need to look at that. Uh, what, code did, what code did they say we should receive? Uh, can we... Protocol error code. Protocol error code. Okay, so that's 1002, right? Let me refresh my memory. I think 1002 is protocol error. Yes. Protocol error. So um, 1009 is not even correct. So my test is wrong. This should be 1002. So maybe that fixes it. But I'm not reproducing the um, the the getting stuck thing. Oh, we're masking in the wrong direction. Okay. We need to mask on transmit. This is not expecting to be um, masked on receive. Wait. I didn't expect that. Can I put a breakpoint on that and look at it? Debugger it. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. What's our code? Oh, it actually correctly gave it to us. So, yeah, that means it didn't process it correctly. Okay. Well, that's what we should get. Mm, receive frames. Try to receive frames, which calls ultimately receive frame. Okay. Oh, there's no length check. Hold on, where do I do the length check? I never do it. Oh. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> um, yeah. I thought I did that. Where did I do the frame too long before? What's the error again? Ah. It's not even in my buffer. Frame payload too large. Where do I use that? I don't use it in... Oh, I'm in the receiver. I need to be in the sender. I think I only use it in the send... No, what? I don't use it at all. Oh, no, I do use it there. Here it is. Okay, I found it. This if if it goes... Okay, this is a different kind of too large. This means we exceeded our max frame size, which I didn't set. Okay. Oh, okay, here's where we check on sending. 
and I check it for close with status ping and there's we can't actually send a pong okay so that's so, okay then I the to code is totally missing <laughs> where is the right place to put it it would be in frame receiver right because here we get the op code We already know the header length, so we just do the check right here. All right, so check to make sure the, um, where is this specified actually? Do they say? Okay, do I need to look for the number 126 or 120? Okay. Where do they say closes can't be that long? They must say it somewhere. Or is it reason? Okay, I don't see where they actually set a size limit. It's got to be here somewhere, though. <sighs> Length? Don't suppose anyone happens to know. Or maybe it says it here. Hmm. I don't... <laughs> Where is it? Where's the rule? It's got to be in there somewhere. Otherwise, I wouldn't have written this code. Uh, uh, one plus two. The plus two code. Where was that? Here. Max control frame data. This is the maximum length of a control frame. I don't know where that is. Is it 125? Oh, there it is. All control frames must have a payload length of 125 bytes or less and must not be fragmented. All right. Why 125? So, one, oh, right, because 126 is too many. 125 is, is enough. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, when it gets later in the afternoon, like, my brain just starts to get fried. So definitely we're only checking it in when we're sending. Okay, so then back to receiver here. Check to make Okay, if the opcode indicates indicates a control frame, verify uh, that the uh, payload is small enough. I should since I have a hard time finding it, let me leave a reference to myself in the future. RFC. A sixty four fifty five section five point five says all control frames must have a payload length of twenty five bytes or less and must not be fragmented. There we go. Uh, there we go. Um and then a 
quick way of knowing if something is a control frame, I suppose, would be to mask the opcode. Right, so the upper bit says it's a control frame. They probably say that somewhere. Right. Control frames identified by opcodes with the most significant bit is one. So li quite literally, it would be if opcode masked with eight is not equal to zero. Or, yeah, you know, I like to say not equal to zero rather than repeating the eight. Um, and, well, and payload length is greater than the constant that I defined max control frame data length then we have a problem right oh need to import that okay am i equipped to return an error i am return error a uh, bad frame frame too long all right back to the unit test we go Run test. Still fail. Oh, large. Large. Masking a decimal like that feels wrong. I mean, I could put it back to hexadecimal. I guess I was thinking, ah, oh, it's small enough where, eh, I guess you're right. Now, the question is, how many um, hex digits, because technically opcode is only four bits wide, so I should probably keep it a four-bit hexadecimal, right? Actually, can we do binary in Rust? Ooh, I can. There we go. Does it look nicer when I do that? That's, that's the best, because then we can say exactly the number of bits we care about, right? I like Rust, if nothing but that I can have binary literals. Okay. Can uh, we please run from WebSockets all my tests? I, I never, I don't 100% of the time get the plural versus singular on that correct. We have 60 tests now. Should we try running the... Um, what happened to my shell to run this? Ah, uh, did we lose? I think I lost the shell for it. So I guess I'll have to do it again. Cargo run example autobahn client. And we need to put the test run count back up to the maximum. There we go. Let's see if we pass it this time. Hey, we passed it. We got all the way to the end. Yay. All right. I bet we failed some, though. Okay, so back, reload. Hey, look at that. We got further. We failed a whole bunch, though. <laughs> Invalid close codes fuzz initiated. Oh, interesting. I guess we're not supposed to echo back invalid close codes. I didn't know that. Okay, they learned something. I wish it would just show me the ones that passed and not the missing ones, or the ones that failed only. Okay, so we made progress. Actually, the one that we were failing one up here, now we're passing it. I wonder if that was related to the one we just fixed. So there's some non-strict ones. I'd rather get the ones that fail first, though. Here's one that definitely, okay, there's, there's an unclean. What's this one about? Send a close frame of payload zero, no close code, no reason code. What do we ex... Oh, wait, why am I clicking there? I should just click on... What, this? This right here, right? Uh, where was that unclean? 
We're not sending a 1,000 response. Is that the problem? Um, okay. I don't... It's masked. Oh, here it is. 03ED. Is that the wrong code? Hold on. Uh, uh, uh. I have too many windows now. I have a scroll bar. Uh, calc. What is, um, 3ED? 1005. Hold on. Send frame, close frame, payload, zero length, no code, close code, no reason. The spec requires a connection to be, to be failed cleanly here. What does that mean? Okay, was clean. If only a full WebSocket closing handshake was performed, close frame sent and received, and the server dropped the TCB, which is its responsibility. Got it. Okay, so, um... I'm, I'm guessing that the values here are for our run, so if I go to the other one, which did with pass without an unclean, what does it say? Oh, it has a true there. Okay. Oh, the code is different. That's, um, instead of ED, it's E8, 1000. Okay, so we sent code 1005. Oh, we're not supposed to send that one, right? Okay, so I need to figure out why we're sending code 1005. Yeah, we got a 1005. So that's what's triggering it. We sent a code 1005 when they did what? When they sent us a close with no payload. All right, I guess I'll make a unit test for that. But first, I want to check in what I did. Uh, git cola. We don't need this anymore, right? Well, I, yeah, I don't need uh, I don't need that. What if, okay, I'll stage. I'll just unstage the things we don't need. I don't need that or that or that. Actually, no. I do want it. I did want that one. What do I not want? I do. No, I don't want that one. I do want that one. I should actually make that something we type on the command line, really when I um, stop being lazy, I'll do that. Uh, these should be actually staged differently. So let me unstage these. I staged this one saying, um, work around lag in local hostname lookups. This is for me only. Okay, then um, the rest of this file sans these changes is uh, remove dead code, well, commented out test code. And then I can un, I can revert this one. Okay, so this is the fix, right? Fix bug in uh, receiving control frames that are too large. So, um, detect, reseed control frames that are too large and drop, well, and uh, fail the uh, connection when this happens. Commit that. All right, so that's one f bug that Autobahn helped us find. New get GUI at get cola. I still have that in my buffer here. Get cola. Uh, Endurance is to thank for letting me know about get cola. 
Okay, so to reproduce this, I'll just make a test for this, right? Don't I already... I thought I already had one for that. Um, it would be literally the... The oct... Why are these octets so long? Yeah, what is all this junk? Is is this part of the test to send something and then close? That's weird. Why do they include a whole bunch of Oh, this is the this is the HTTP request, HTTP response. That's what it is. Okay, so it's 8800. I want to see do I have a test that does uh 8800. No. Um I'm in the wrong file. 88 Zero, zero. I do. But that's on the other direction. Okay, so that's that's it. We don't have a test that actually um, does that on the Rx side. Oh, let's do it then. So, another test. Receive, close, no payload. Alright, so it's actually very similar to this. We just send out... Um, 8800, and I don't even need to do this chaining junk, so it's just that. And this wants me to actually give it a slice, so I'll do that. Okay, and the code we're supposed to get back is, what do they say? What do they expect? Normal code. I guess that's 1000, right? With no reason? Do I have an extra one for this? Okay, just string is just empty then. All right, run. Okay, it does fail. Yep, 1,005. Okay, so why are we sending 1,005? 1,005. So it's some kind of uncaught error. Yeah, what are these? Initiate, close, no status returned. What is 1005 again? 1005. The reserve value must not be sent as a status code. It's just for use in your application is expecting a status code indicate no status. Oh, okay, so we're only supposed to return that locally. We're not supposed to transmit it. Got it. So actually then, um, this was correct. It should be 1005, but... We need to check the other direction. We need to check um, WebSocket output that that it returns a one thousand, not a one thousand five. So let me find that um, WebSocket output. Yeah, this stuff. Okay, this we should receive back on the return path. So where do I put that? Right here. Yeah, because it won't actually be sent. Actually, it doesn't matter. We can put that here, right? So it should get an 80. Oh. No, 8880, right? That's what we should get back. The, the mask bit has to be set because we're send, setting the mask bit on transmit. Oh, do we need to put junk in there? What am I doing in the actual capture? Uh, can I see that? Uh, no, I can't see it there. Might as well close that one. Which window am I looking for? This one. What do we get? Okay, it doesn't matter what the mask is. We need to have a mask because it's required, but that we don't send... So we just send XX, XX. And this uh, needs to actually have that variable. Why is this a problem? Cannot borrow it as... Oh, mutable. All right. Okay, so let's test that. So we should receive a 1005, but we, when we set, send out... Okay, nothing was sent. Why is nothing sent? Is that because of this? Thank you for the follow.
I think this is it. Uh, we don't actually want to close until we've received that back, received that back out, right? If I remove that, does it stall? It does not. Still, it gets broken. None for output. We should receive something, though. Oh, wait, no, it won't, because it's waiting for us to reply. Ah, uh, shoot. Yeah, we don't auto-reply. Yeah, 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 okay. Um, this may be a design mistake, but I'm, I'm expecting the user to reply with the uh, close on, on our side, right? Um, right, so send back the close. Send back a close. To uh, to do, we um we might want Web Socket to uh, do this for us. Yeah, right now um I think the idea was we might even though they've closed their end we might want to continue to send them stuff. If we let the Web Socket do it for us, then uh, we wouldn't be able to send anything. But I could handle it where. Um, when we do a close on our end, like if I ac actually have to say close on it, like, uh, well, I can't do it. I'd have to split the WebSocket to do this, but we split it and then give the source here. And then with the sync, I do a close that would imply sending a close at the end, wouldn't it? I'll just keep my API the way it is and leave the to-do there. So the way we do it is um, we need to borrow the transmitter end. So this goes to interior mutability again for transmit so that we can borrow it. So it's that dot borrow mute dot. Uh, oh, I don't want the back end. Shoot. I don't want that. Oh, I want. Um, oh, no, I do want that. What do I want? I, Oh, no, I don't want the back end. I want to split the um, the WebSocket. So I do want to split, yeah. So let sync stream equal WebSocket split. And then um, we're going to use the sync. So I'm going to let the sync equal uh, ref cell new sync. So that I can say here, sync dot borrow mute dot send... Send requires a mutable reference, right? Yes. Actually, that's what that underline means. Uh, send. What do we want to send? We want to send sync message close no status. Exactly. And then that is um, asynchronous, so I need to await it. And uh, it returns something, right? I don't want to do a websock. I want to do a sync a stream. What does that return? A result, so we don't care about the result. Yeah, so I do need the TX. But we don't need to... Actually, what's wrong with this one? Oh, mutable. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess I don't need, didn't need to do that, right? Because it doesn't stall. Still getting a none, though. It's like it didn't send it. Why would it not send it? Oh, because we have to we have to do, run that one first. That's right. Okay, so that has to run, and then we do that. Okay. Actually, this might stall now. No. Okay, but we're close. Okay, here's the bug. So we didn't actually... Um, Oh, no. Actually, the problem is that the mask isn't correct. Yes. So we can't expect just X's. We have to um, expect something. So how do I do this? With a match? 
I could do this with a match, right? Ex assert matches. Some like vector. How do I say this? Do I do um? I, uh, never mind. I'll I'll. I won't try to be tricky here. I'll just say um, let the output equal that. The type of this is option vector. So um. First assert that output is sum. Then let output equals output dot unwrap. And then assert equal to um, six output length. And then we can do assert equal for the first two bytes. Uh, output. At this point, what is output again? It's a vector. So I can say. Zero to, to two inclusive, uh, zero to one inclusive, or zero to two actually is easier for me to think of. And we don't have the sum here, and I think I don't need to slice that, or do I? Maybe I do. But don't borrow, right? Yes. Okay. So we should get some output. When we unwrap it, it should be six bytes, and the first two bytes are that, and we don't care about the mask. Okay, so it's passing. Did I actually change any code? Because I thought we were failing the test, and we were returning the wrong code. So what happened there? Oh, wait, I know what happened. Our, um... When we get a 1005, we need to do that. Okay, so it's in my Autobahn script, then. Yes, that's a problem. We sh we're not supposed to echo back any old status code. This one right here, right? So we don't want to send the code back if it's 1,000. Uh, I want to do this differently, right? If code is 1,005, we're sending something slightly different. Um, I could do a... I can do this in front. Actually, I can... Do it internally. I can do it here. That. Else something else. Web socket sync message close no status. I was hoping it would format that code for me, but it didn't. a case where the formatter is... Oh, there, there it went. Okay, it does want to format like that. That's sort of weird. I guess this is in alignment with that, so it's not terrible. Yeah, okay. So, we're running it again. L Autobahn. Autobahn. Here we go. Running all the tests. Doop doo. -doo. Hey, this is a hydrate break opportunity. Okay. Report is updated, so let's go back. Refresh. Uh, we still fail? Huh. Okay. Wait. It's like it didn't change, but it should be working. This is where I start to doubt if we're actually doing the right thing. Um, oh, this is backwards. <laughs> Gotta love it when I get things backwards. Okay, run again. Hey, that's just another excuse to drink some more water. I think I need to take a break of my eyes. So look into the distance. Starting to get dark. Alright. 
updated reports. Reload. Oh, look at that. We passed now. I don't even forget which one it was. We were passing it, whatever it was. Which one was it? Anybody remember? Okay, whatever one we fail, we now pass. Now we just, have to, we just have these fails at the end, which have to do, I think, again, with yeah, invalid close codes. Okay. So what did they return? They returned something, which it's hard to see. It's in this mess, right? It's masked. I suppose it should be something like invalid status code. Or invalid close code or something. Okay, so I'm going to say we fixed that other bug because it's passing now. And the bug wasn't in the WebSocket so much as, um, well, this, we'll just say we added. Add a unit test for something already working. Because the bug wasn't in the um, library, it was in the example. So, in the example, um, don't echo back one th close status, close code 1005. Actually, that makes me think that there ought to be a test to make sure the user can't send 1005 as a closed status. Yeah, I'm going to do I'm going to add that really quick. So, that is really quick. I'll just go to the unit tests and um add one where um we um are not allowed to to close. So, that's sync message close. So, it's this one, right? Although I can simplify this a lot. Yeah, I can just take... Well, it doesn't even need to be this elaborate. Hold on, I can... Um, yeah, okay. Uh, what am I going to copy then? Something simpler. Yeah, this one. Okay. We'll turn this one into trying to send code 1005, which should be not legal. All right, so send close code 1005 explicitly. Right, so that if we try to send code 1005, and it doesn't matter what we put there for the reason, we should get an error like uh, string new. Should you get a special error? Do I have an error code for that? Like, um, bad close code? I probably don't, actually. I don't think I have a special error for that. Let's add one. So, um, bad close code. Uh, error. Invalid code given to col for close frame. Uh, this this happens. Well, th this indicates the user tried to send an illegal code when uh, in an outgoing close frame. Is that how I? I'm mentioning these things? Well, no. It's lowercase with a backtick. All right. Bad close code is what we should get. So this will fail right now because I'm not doing that. Instead, it is, um, yeah, it's matching OK or something. OK, so then the way we would catch this would be in the, in the sync API. So that's uh, WebSockets poll neck, no, up here.
uh, it's like pole send or something. Start send. That's that's what it is. Okay, so here. Close message with status. All right, so we check the length is correct, but we don't check the code. So we need to check the code. So maybe an else if? For now, just make sure the code isn't... Um, if it's 1005, then it's another special error. Bad close code. All right. There are other invalid close codes we should check, but I'm not going to worry about that until Autobahn tells me I do. Sweet. Okay. I knew that would be quick. So, prevent user from sending close frame with 1005 code. Uh, stage, commit, push it. Okay. So then the next Autobahn error, right? I think these look like they're... We're receiving invalid close codes and we're not sending the correct one or we're not detecting that it's an invalid close code. Let's, let me see. Okay, invalid close code. We're supposed to get a protocol error or drop the TCP. So yeah, we need to send a protocol error for invalid codes. All right, so um, I need to look at what is considered invalid. So these are all valid except 1005. Okay, 1004 is reserved, so I guess that's technically invalid also, right? Okay, so technically it's easier to just make sure that it's in the range of the valid codes, I guess. So it's 1000, 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and that's it. Let me look at what they say. So, can't use 0, 999, 1004, 1005. Wait a minute, 1006 is not valid? I thought that was in here. Oh, it must not be sent. Okay, so 1006 you can't send either. Okay. That thou, um, 14 is invalid and so is in 15. Okay. So they just run through them all, and they, they, why do they have 16 invalid? Oh, probably test, this is corner cases, t testing beyond the range. All right, so that's easy enough. Uh, we can um, go to uh, try receive frames again, or was it, I can't remember where I put this stuff. Was it in frame receiver? See, we were talk talking about organization earlier, and I'm like, I can't find my own stuff. Maybe I don't have the best organization, you know? Okay, so we should look, go in here where it's opcode close, right? Yes, so we should check it here. If, what's the best way to do it? If it doesn't match, and then give a whole bunch of numbers? If not matches... Mm, code? What's the, where's the code? Oh, we need to, um, I need to do inside of receive close frame because that's where we decode the code. Yeah, right here. Here it is. So, if not matches code, and then we have a whole bunch of alternatives, right? The, the legal codes. So those were a thousand... 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. Not 4, not 5, not 6. 1,007. So I should probably list them like... Well, it's going to auto-format it, isn't it? 1,008, 1,009, 1,010, 11. And those are the only legal ones, right? Yes. So if it's not in that range, uh, oh, one, there we go. Okay, so if it's not in that range, it's an error, right? So uh, return error, error um, bad frame, 
And we're going to say um, illegal close code. So that means in the test, if I had one, which I should probably add one, we should expect to receive that in the return path. Okay, so where is one of those? This one, right? Yeah. So I'm going to grab this test. Paste it down here. I should have written the test first. Receive close illegal code. Okay, so then we should get, um, for the reason here, illegal close code. And we sh should I also detect it on the output? I never bothered to do that here. I'm not going to bother. I'll, so I'll just do it um, here. So um, let's say that there is a code. So that would be what? Two for the payload. And then we put the code there. Um, I don't know. Let's pick 1005 or something like that. That's a good one. That's 3ED. Okay, 3ED. That is illegal. And I don't need to do this chaining business, right? Yeah, so it's back to this slice again. All right, run it. Okay, so pass the test. Run Autobahn again. Every time I run Autobahn, I should take a drink. Maybe it should be every time I run Autobahn, I have to take a shot. <laughs> Until I get it running or I um, pass out, whichever happens first. We probably don't need this anymore. Actually, I'm going to leave that around in the background. Uh, where is... Here it is. Go back up. Reload. Okay. Those passed, but now we have some... Actually, no. We still have some fails. Valid close code. Oh, okay. Maybe I was overly strict. Oh, 3000 is valid? Oh, I missed that. Okay, reserved for use by frameworks. They're, they're undefined. Their interpretation is undefined, but they're not illegal. Okay, so 4,000... Okay, so these should be allowed. Right? 3,000 to 49.99 are allowed. Okay, so then I just need to update the... Um, I, I'm just going to update the, this match here. Just say... Um, or, I don't know, code if code is greater than or equal to 3,000 and code is less than 5,000. Or, yeah, 5,000, right? I can't do that? Get as it as a range? I think I have to. It's not going to let me do that unless I bind it in all patterns. Bummer. Thank you, Sarian. You are correct. Actually, I didn't know you could do that. So you could you can match a single number to a range. So I could say three thousand to five thousand. Uh, maybe I have to put it in parentheses. No. Okay. So I can't quite do that. It's experimental. Oh no. So I had to do uh inclusive. So it's 4999. Does that mean I don't need the parentheses? Don't need them. Isn't that funny how it formatted that? It insists on doing that. It's weird. All because of this. I'm almost tempted to break it into two things. Like two different matches. Ah, just leave it. I'll just leave it. I'm lazy today. <laughs> Take a drink. I'm out of water.
Okay. Reload we go. We pass now. Okay, so we're not failing any tests anymore. But we have some that um that say non strict. So I think I want to look at that after I do the another the next commit. Okay, so this will be uh reject reject close received close frames with illegal status with illegal code legal codes commit all right now it's this first non strict one Send a small message, then send again with a reserve bit, then send a ping. Echo. First message received, but then co connection has failed immediately since the reserve message is zero. The pong is not received. Okay. So it never got back the echo, I guess. Oh, that's because... The um, the echo back for the close actually beats the um, client. Actually, I'm okay with this being the way it is because, like, if you sent one and then you immediately sent again before you before receiving the uh, reply, then it's just a race, isn't it? It's a race between. Do we process that first message or do we drop it? Yeah, why why do they care? Why do they expect the echo to be received on the first one? Yeah, it's probably going to show that, um, yeah, they sent... Before we even um, replied on the first one, they sent the second one, which is illegal, and we we beat it. We beat it to them. How would I avoid that? Oh, what would I do? I would have to postpone processing these messages until I know that these ones have been received. So I'd have to queue messages. I have to make it synchronous, but by definition, my library is asynchronous. Should I force it to be synchronous just to handle their ideal case where we echo back this one? Because we were synchronously handling it before handling it this one, we handled this one completely all the way up to the client? The impact would be that we couldn't pipeline the processing of received messages. Basically, the... The code could not e begin to interpret these bytes until it had completely figured out what it's going to do with that message and computed the response and sent it. Otherwise, when we look at that, when we see that there's a problem, we would have to like remember that that's a problem and then know when to inject the close frame because the client might want, might have more to say than just echoing that back, right? Yeah, maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm I'm fine leaving this non-strict. Because the alternative, I don't like the alternative. Of forcing it to be synchronous. And actually, how do we even know? How do we know when the client, the client is done? The client might not even echo at all. Yeah, there's no way I can do this without make without adding an extra like restriction to the use case of my websocket. I'm just going to ignore that one. What about these what about these other ones? Should I do I need to look at all of these? Yeah, it's always then send again. And then the echo of the first one's received. I'm just going to ignore those. What about these other cases down here. 
it's again, it's send it, then send again, echo, first is received. So skip, skipping those, what about this third set? Yeah, I think I just looked at that twice. How about this one right here? Send text message fragmented into two fragments, then continuation frame with finish equals false where there is nothing to continue. Then unfragmented text messages all sent in one chop. Why does it matter if it's sent in one chop? Oh. They expect to see the first message that's been defragmented. Okay, well, it's the same thing. Like, it's a race. Yeah. Uh, back. Okay. Okay, the final set looks like fail for invalid UTF-8. It's, again, it's, um, it's, uh, send something which is good and then something, send something which is bad. Wait, the non-strict is to get back to B. Well, hold on, this might be different. Send invalid UTF-8 text in three parts. First frame is, val is valid, then wait, then second frame which contains the ma payload masking the sequence invalid, then wait, then the third frame with the rest. One and three are valid in themselves. Two is encoded as in the UTF-8 integer encoding scheme, but the code point is invalid out of range. Oh, wait, they observe, we actually sent, huh, okay. I think this is a race again. It's difficult for me to see what was actually sent. <laughs> That's actually a close. So we never sent anything. What's this delay timeout for tag A? Oh, I see, because it was false, false, true. Okay, so this one is expecting that we might echo back um, some some part of it, but we didn't echo back anything. Then why do they say non-strike timeout AB? Observe timeout AB. I don't get that. Oh, times out. It doesn't receive back the echo. I get it. So they're saying it should disconnect on the second frame, but it's okay to time out on... I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand. This is really strangely worded to me, but the, this makes sense to me. That um, we decided to close invalid UTF-8 after receiving the entire message. Well, yeah, that's my design decision. We don't know if something is invalid until we receive the whole message, right? Actually, maybe we could, because they said the invalid one, you could tell by looking at just the, first, the second frame. It's F4908080. So we know that's out of range, right? So I could ask Rust, hey, is this a complete code that's invalid? Yeah, I'm not going to bother. I think this is just too fine too finely grained same as this one okay i'm not going to care about these i don't care that they're strict the strict is not um important okay i think i'm done <laughs> i think all the ones that are important we pass all of the all the non-important ones that were not entirely strict were fine maybe do i want to do the um performance limit one i would have to in change the docker command to do that. Maybe, maybe we'll just do it for kicks to finish up the stream. Do I have any changes pending? No, I don't. Okay, so let me go back into the docker thing. Stop the image. And then, that's right, we're doing VI. Uh, config fuzzing server. Let's, um, let's just include all the cases. There, that's all, the, that, that's all the VI I'm willing to do today. 
All right, so now we're running all the test cases, and I think I'm going to run Autobonds first to get a reference. So that's here, right? Uh, this one. So now we're running Autobonds own implementation. There's 519 test cases now. I have no idea how long it'll take to run all of the, these, though. These might take a while. That Okay. I might not want to run them on stream because it's taking a long time. I have no idea how long it's going to take. 260 out of 519. 261. Yeah, these are slow. So they commented these out in the example because they're really slow. Actually, there's no reason why I can't do this in parallel with uh, my own one, right? So why don't, why don't I just run it again? Run them in parallel. See which one wins first. Run the Rust version release mode. You think you could catch up to the Python? <laughs> sure, let's not. Let's do it. Uh, that's um, run release, right? So we gave the Python one a big head start. See if the rust catches up. I don't think it will. Who knows? Maybe it will. I don't know. Oh, there's an import we don't need. Okay, now it's running. See if the rust catches up. A rust compilation or the Python tests, exactly. Python tests are kind of slow. These could be slowed down just by the fuzz server taking a long time, you know? Actually, those do seem to be going quite faster than the Python one. Ooh, we're catching up! We're catching up, chat! I think the, the Rust is actually going to pass the Python. Ooh, it did! It's done. It is done. <laughs> the Python one's still, still running. Wow, okay. But I might have failed tests, though. <laughs> So do I wait for this one to finish? That might take forever. Actually, it updated the test so far for that one. So we can at least see the test results, right? I just need to open up another shell. So there's the server. There's the Python client. I need another shell. A third shell, please. Another shell. Okay. So we're in the um, Autobahn folder, and I want to do Firefox results, reports, clients, index. All right. And scroll down to, oh, is it nine performance? Why are these marked as unimplemented? Oh, that's an extension. Okay, we don't implement the compression extension. Okay, that's that's maybe why we beat them. <laughs> we beat them because we don't implement that extension. Okay, well, what about the, the okay the nine the limits performance we pass? Okay, so it wasn't a fair comparison, but we did pass them all. They all pass except for the ones that are not fair because uh, we're not implement. And these ones are taking a long time. Actually, here are the speed we actually have um, speed comparisons here. So um, ours is comparable on some, faster on some, and slower on others. Why would that be? So here we're slower. Here we're a little slower, a little slower, a uh, slower, a little bit faster, and a lot faster. I mean, it could be my code. Who knows? Okay, these, some of them are a lot faster. In general, we're almost always faster yeah well it looks like in general we're faster sometimes up to eight times faster hey there rally monkey you're five hours and 38 minutes late to my stream wow yes you are <laughs> we're running uh, an automated test suite against uh, my web socket client implementation oh that's the other thing i'm only te testing the client I need to do this again with the server. I don't know. Should I implement the um, compression? That's an extension to WebSockets. 
It looks like the, the tests involved take a long time, like 10, 20 seconds for each one. Large JSON data file. It's still running, right? Yeah, still running. Only on up to 320 now. I'll think about it. I guess what it is, if I ever come back and implement WebSocket compression, I'll make sure to run the Autobahn test suite again. Okay, I declare my implementation passing non-strictly to Autobahn. And let's move on. Yeah, close the tabs. Okay, so I don't need this shell anymore. Just for out of kicks, I'll just let that run. What do we want to do now? Do I need to end the stream? Or can I do a little bit more work? Wasn't there something else I was going to do? Let's make sure the workspace is clean. Optimize those slow tests. Who knows why they're slow, though? When I run my unit tests, they're blazing fast. See, watch this. Cargo test release. Oh, I need to uh, do it with the timing thing for you to see the time. Okay, I'll just let it build, let it build. Okay, uh, it's dash, 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 Z, unstable options, dash, dash. Um, I forget. It's in the Discord. Someone gave it to me. Was it in... I can't remember which one. It, I need to bookmark this. Is it in coding help? I don't even remember. I don't think it was in coding help. Maybe it was in show and tell. Yeah, show and tell. Okay, it's report time. There we go. Okay. Yeah. They take so little time to run, it's all 0 0.000 seconds. My unit tests. So, uh, oh, here's one that put, took 0 0.001 second. Another one that took 0 0.001. So they're really, really, really fast. So I don't know why some of these tests would be slow. Are these done yet? No, they're not done yet. A whole millisecond, that's right. Well, it's rounding up, maybe. And it could be... I don't know what it could be. It's running all the tests... What if... If it's running all the tests um, in parallel, then... It could be a task spawning thing. So what if I run it with um, test threads 1? Now are they all zero? I think they're all zero now. <laughs> so that one millisecond might might have been like thread spawning time because when you don't run test threads one, it I think it runs as many threads as you have cores, and so it'll be a burst of CPU activity. Yeah, I don't see a single non-zero in here. Yeah, okay. I, I'm gonna chalk it up to being a thread spawn lag. Okay, so um, what do I want to do now? Besides maybe optimize for for um, Autobahn. I don't know. Hey there, Sam Furge. Just finishing up. We got uh, my WebSocket implementation tested with uh, Autobahn. I can close this now, right? I don't need that. Stop and quit without saving. That's right. Uh, why is it taking so long to stop? Probably because it collected like a billion packets there. All right. I was hoping to show you when this is done, but yeah, I'll have to open up another terminal to get to it. Autobahn Firefox index. So this is what I did today. I um side by side comparison Autobahn's own Python implementation of WebSockets with mine and got all of the test failures fixed. So there were what, maybe three or four different categories of failures. 
and um, a lot of uh, some of the the big sets of failures were handling invalid close codes. I think. Yeah, the close handling and valid code. So we passed those all now. There were a few other ones that we failed that had to do with messages that were too long, and I fixed that. Oh, sending a co cl close code that was invalid. But what's really cool is, like, all the other tests that just han handle, like, all the bulk of what you would do, text, binary, all that pings, pongs, are passing, which made me really happy that we didn't have any failures there. You know what's weird is none of those show a time until we get to the performance ones. Okay, here's really weird. We're much faster than the Python one until the size gets really big and then it flips the other way around. I wonder if it's because of how much memory I, I allocate at runtime. I make My code makes a guess about how big a message could get and that guess is up here somewhere. Uh, may, no, not necessarily there. It would be in um, WebSocket at the top. Yeah, 65,536. So that's uh, uh, just a guess, right? So they might have in Python a better strategy for coping with really, really huge messages. Increasing fragment size. Oh, wow, we blew Python out of the water there. Ten times faster than Python. So there's... It's, hard, it's really hard to read because it's microscopic text, but it's... 1449 milliseconds versus 118. Should compare it to my C++ one? I would have to port this Autobahn client to C++ though. Oh, I should try to refactor this because the one from uh, Tungstenite is much smaller. <laughs> they fit their Autobahn script into 60 lines. They cheated, though. They did unwrap in a lot of spaces. I, mean, I guess if we didn't care about handling errors, we could have cheated as well. Like, I, I, I had a custom error thing. I think they just unwrapped everything except for a few things. What language is this? It's Rust. It's a programming language that people wanted me to get into, and I got into it, and I love it. How could I crunch this down? Oh, the fact that I don't have a way to mirror messages back and I have to construct a sync message from a stream message, whereas they can just do a... Um, where is it? They can take what they get from the message and just write it back in one line. Cheaters. <laughs> but again, they don't handle... Okay, they do handle errors. So I could handle error the same way. Instead of doing this let, I could have caught the error and um, errored out. Hmm. They also don't wrap as much as my code does because their names are shorter. They hard coded the the URL everywhere, and I have it parameterized, so it's better. Ah. Uh, there was a warning at the top. I should just fix that. There we go. No warnings. Do we have any other problems? No problems. I like to see no problems. Does that problems thing actually work? What happens if I put the warning back? Oh, yep. Problems tab works. Not a single warning anywhere in my code. Love it. Let's check that uh, one line fix in there. Fix warning, right? Fix... Uh, Warning about unused import. Commit. Push it. So is Rust like getting close to C++ versatility yet? Pretty much, if not past it. So I haven't yet found something in C++ I can't do in Rust. But how you, you do some things in, in particular... Concurrent processing is much different than what I'm used to in C++. Um, that's not what I was looking for. Which is the right, cor correct? Yeah. What I like about Rust. So, um, there are all these things which Rust has that C++ doesn't. 
So I would say that C there are things there's things that Rust has that C++ doesn't and vice versa, but I haven't yet run into what's missing from Rust other than documentation. Wonder if OSs have native APIs for Rust yet? Not that I know of. So what um I've seen done is um people use the um there are two crates that I know of. There's libc is the raw bindings to platform and the other one was uh win api raw bindings for windows apis so in a sense if you consider the crates available online as part of the ecosystem you can say that these are the native apis for rust are this crate <laughs> curious what c20 would bring to rust table versus rust yeah me too actually i have a friend who um is an ad who told me that not only does he know Rust now, but he's an advocate of Rust. But C plus plus twenty, he said, is really nice, and he so he hasn't given up on C plus plus yet. Is that the package manager for Rust? This is one alternative package manager. This looks into the same database uh, as what most people use. I like to use this one because. Um, it will show um, the dependencies with features over here. But the one that most people use is uh, crates.io. So um, same kind of thing. I can look up libc and click it there. The, it, they use the same database. It's all sort of built into Rust that the package management and publishing and deployment is all somewhat standardized. And design is pretty nice. And most people have... Uh, when they publish a crate, which is what Rust calls a library, they will um, have a link to where they keep the code in GitHub or wherever, and the crates.io and the lib.rs both um, will fetch the readme from the repository and kind of auto-populate this. So, like when I published my crate pantry, for example, I just ran one command, and as long as I had a readme, it just showed up here. It even uh, shows if my tests are passing, which is kind of neat. Wow, 33 people have downloaded it? Wow. It's got an uptick recently, huh? That's probably me downloading it. <laughs> All right. Programming is stressful, I think, but it's also very rewarding. Hey there, C17R. You want to study something else? Just keep in mind that studying programming for a job is maybe stressful but rewarding in the end money wise i mean it's also rewarding when you solve problems like i've been saying with rust in particular what uh wish i could type this far faster i can answer my own questions i feel a real sense of accomplishment when i get something to compile in rust so there's that um that rush you get when stuff starts to work like the fact that my stuff now passes all the autobahn tests it's pretty sweet yeah, studying in general is stressful. My kids would say that would probably agree with that too. All right. Um, I think I'm done with this. Can't think of anything more I want to do. Oh, what happened there? Remove that. Oh, I do. I want to make the uh, the IP, the host name, um, or the authority part um, on the command line. So let me take a leaf out of my other example. Rover. And Rover includes structop. So we'll do the same thing in Autobahn client. Okay, so we're okay, here we go. Uh we want structop. Okay, then back in Rover, the way I use structop is very simple. We made an options which just has a URI. So I'm going to do the same thing. So we'll have a struct dot here. And uh, we need to use... <clears throat> my, I'm starting to lose my voice. We need to pull in struct dot. <clears throat> pull in struct dot and we'll comment this as the uh, base URI of the auto bon test suite fuzz server and the default i'm going to leave the default at that because that's that means i don't need to type anything 
And we're not including the slash. Correct. So then um, we'll call that base URI. Okay, so then how do we use struct up again? We let the options equal options from arguments, of course. And then we can just use options base URI in place of this string here. So opts dot base URI. Um, what's wrong with this one now? Wait, that was okay before. Why is it wrong now? Well, that's really weird. Oh, because they're different types. Okay, yeah, okay, I messed up here. If these are different, so we need to have like T, uh, how about um, T1, T2? We need to do this because otherwise they're going to be constrained to be the same type. That was a good catch, don't you think? Okay, so now I should be able to run on the command line um, terminal. If I um, run it without arguments, it should do the default address. It's going to compile. It's going to take a while to compile, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, the problem is I'm out of water. I need to go get some water. I think I'm nearing the end of the stream anyway. We've been going for almost six hours. Six hours is a good stream. Maybe tomorrow I'll do the server testing. Okay, so I wanted to test if I now do WS and I do um, the address again, it should also work. Yeah, but now if I type in a different port number, it should fail. Saying that it connections refused. Perfect. All right, let's check that in. Get cola. Changes here are. What do we, what do we want to say? Allow the base URI of the server to be. Um, I I don't know how to say words. Let the user override the base URI of the server. So this is uh, for Autobahn client. This is too long, so I'm just going to move. Whoops. Oh, that happened. There's no undo here. I just lost what I typed. Okay. Um, I'll have to type it again. Let the user override the base URI of the Autobahn test suite fuzz server by, um, by specifying, by, by providing it on the command line. Autobahn client uh, allow overriding base URI. Okay, that's good for m enough. Commit. Okay, if you want to play with it, I haven't published it yet, but it is at github.com rhymeway354 websockets.git Both C++ and Rust implementations. One uh, thing to note that if you were to look at it now, I am not using a um, an actual real name for the crate when I'm going to publish it. So I have a placeholder name. And it happens to be that there already is a crate out there owned by someone else with that placeholder name, WebSockets. So that's not mine. This will go somewhere else, not mine. <laughs> I simply haven't published it yet. Hydrate, please. I'm just going to end the stream because I need to. I need to eat dinner anyway. All right. So wrap it up. Hmm. I keep thinking I'm missing something. Oh, I wanted to see what was up with the Python. It's still running. Hey, maybe this will be done by tomorrow. You think? <laughs> That's taking forever to run. I wonder if we got stuck. Anyway, we'll let that run. Uh, let me find someone else who's doing Rust if I can. Twitch.tv slash team slash Rustations. See if anyone... Oh, no, it's just me. Okay. Then instead of that, let me see if someone else is streaming who's not on the Rust Asians team. Maybe we can go raid them instead. 
You joined in late today? I'm sorry, Sanford. Yeah, we've been going for six hours, so... Sorry that I have to end, but yeah, I gotta eat something. I didn't actually eat lunch, so I'm kind of starving right now. <laughs> Okay, someone that I know is doing open source Go. Go is pretty close to Rust, right? Open source Go, all right. Hey, I don't know anything about Go. Let's go check it out. We're going to raid the Alta 4 stream. I've got 18 more hours to go. Sorry, Cthulhu, not the weekend. I can't do a 24-hour stream. <laughs> all right, I hope you enjoyed the Alta 4 stream. He's, uh, he's a good friend. I actually met him in person once. Not... At the last TwitchCon, because that one was canceled, but the the one from uh, last year. So let's raid the Alta 4 stream. All right, bye, my friends. What do you mean, no? I got to raid somebody. <laughs> All right, so uh, hopefully I'll be back tomorrow. I'm never too sure because my schedule is chaotic, but uh, I hope you enjoyed today. And I hope you enjoy Black Glass's stream as well. This is Alta 4 stream. And I will see you next time, my friends. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.